Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Samaya Nisanki, and I'm one of the co-organizers of this wonderful ECT workshop. Um, I'm an associate professor at the University of Amsterdam, working in gravitational wave and multi-messenger astrophysics, and I'll be chairing today's session. I'm really excited because we have a great lineup of speakers. Um, I'd like to make a few comments and remind you of housekeeping rules um, for the next couple of hours. So number one, um, the request has been from ECT that we, because everything will be on YouTube as well, um, to maybe keep your videos off if you're not speaking, um, as well as in terms of chairing, I will be keeping an eye on the chat as well as the time. So please do, as, a, as we did yesterday, keep discussions on the chat going. Please don't hesitate to write as well as um, at the end of each talk, I will ask for hands up for any questions. And then I think on that note, also just to finally thank the organizers, especially Barbara Gazzoli, who's online, as well as the ECT workshop for um, funding this program workshop. Okay, so without further ado, um, I would like to welcome thankful um, Kromati. Cromarty, sorry. <laughs> um, no to, problem. Um, who is an Einstein Fellow at Cornell University, who will be talking to us about measuring millisecond pulsar masses with Radio Shapiro delay observations. Thank you, Thankful. Thank you so much for the introduction. I really appreciate it. I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, yeah, so as was just said, I'm going to talk to you about how we can use millisecond pulsar timing uh, to precisely measure neutron star masses. Okay, so I'm going to speed through the introduction, but for completeness, I do want to just talk uh, for a half a second about millisecond pulsars and how we time them. So, you know, this is a subset of the neutron star population. They're extremely rapidly rotating, uh, highly magnetized neutron stars. They beam radiation from their magnetic axes as they spin, and it causes this sort of lighthouse effect. And so in that way, they don't actually pulse. Pulsars don't pulse. Um, uh, you know, this 10 kilometer, 1.4 solar mass thing, you know, that's why we're here, so we can skip over that. Um, the, the millisecond pulsars are spun up in this recycling process, uh, and so they accrete a bunch of matter from their companion yeah, yeah. And, and, oh, and spin up to uh, really quick rotational rates. Um, and we know of about 400 millisecond pulsars at this point. Okay, so the reason why millisecond pulsars are, are really phenomenal scientific tools is because they have very stable orbital, um, very stable rotational rates, and uh, you know over long time scales we can we can do this thing called pulsar timing, which is unambiguously accounting for each and every single rotation uh, of a neutron star, and so. If we can predict the time of arrival of each of its pulses and uh, we observe the pulsar and the pulses aren't arriving on time, we know that there's some external effect intervening, something like the interstellar medium or relativistic effects, all kinds of fun things can induce these uh, so-called timing residuals. So difference, differences between your predicted time of arrival of the pulses uh, and your model or and your um, observation. So, uh, in the bottom left plot, you can see a good timing model uh, taking into account all of the necessary parameters will uh, yield residuals that are nicely spread out around zero, but um, structure will be induced if you're missing something like, for example, a uh, proper motion in your model, right? It'll, it'll induce this structure in your timing model, in your timing residuals. And uh, timing millisecond pulsars is responsible for some really, really uh, incredibly precise measurements. So I want to talk very quickly about uh, Nanograv, the North American Nanohertz Observatory for Gravitational Waves, because uh, the Nanograv data set is, is, uh, plays a key role um, in these mass determinations that I'm going to be talking about. So uh, the primary goal of Nanograv is to detect a stochastic background of low frequency gravitational waves. And so in this way, you know, our, our frequency coverage in the gravitational wave space is very complementary to experiments like LISA and LIGO. Um, we're sensitive to a different source population, so we're sensitive to the in spiral of uh, supermassive black hole binaries. Um, and so we time something like 75 right now millisecond pulsars spread all across the sky. 
uh, they constitute our gravitational wave detector. Um, and to observe those pulsars, we use the Green Bank Telescope, the VLA, the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment, um, and then until recently, Arecibo. And a lot of people have been asking, so I'll just very quickly say that uh, you know, the, the loss of Arecibo is really heartbreaking, devastating for a lot of reasons, um, but it doesn't, it's not the end of Dianograv or anything. Um, we're trying to restructure our observing program to, to compensate for it, um, but, but it has impacted us uh, very, you know, it's been hard. Um, so the Nanograv observing program consists of monthly dual frequency observations of all of these millisecond pulsars. Um, and we're working right now on our 15 year data set. And so we have a really extensive, you know, high cadence millisecond pulsar data set. And that means that, you know, not only do we have a great data set for the detection of gravitational waves, but we're also able to get a lot of so-called secondary science out of it. And so, I'm gonna talk about one of those secondary science results. Uh, we will talk about the Pulsar J0740 plus 6620, which I'm sure the vast majority of you uh, recognize. So we know that the equation of state can be translated into these observables, right? This mass radius relationship. And so if we're able to precisely determine the mass of a millisecond pulsar, um, we, we can put constraints on the equation of state. And you know, because of that asymptotic behavior, every measurement of a higher and higher mass neutron star um, has the potential to help us uh, in making those equation of straight state constraints. Um, the problem then is how do we actually measure those neutron star masses precisely? So normal pulsar timing of binaries gives us five Keplerian parameters, things like binary orbital period and centricity. Um, but in a very special subset of, of our millisecond pulsars, we're able to see this relativistic effect called Shapiro delay. So this is what's induced when the millisecond pulsar uh, along our line of sight passes behind its white dwarf, usually white dwarf companion. Um, and the deformation of space time by that white dwarf causes the timing residuals to be delayed. Um, and if we can measure that delay, uh, which is characterized here, we're parameterizing it with the range and shape parameters, um, we can directly measure those. And then, you know, this is assuming uh, the validity of GR, but we can combine the measurements of those two parameters with the mass function in order to get out independent measurements of the neutron star mass, as well as its companion mass, which is a really powerful tool. However, we can only do this, as I said, in a small subset of these systems, partially because of Shapiro delay's really strong dependence on the inclination angle of the system. Um, so it has to be a really, really edge on system to significantly measure Shapiro delay. You can see even the difference between like a 90 degree inclination, and 85 degree inclination. Uh, that's the difference between the, the highest and the second highest uh, lines there is vast. So um, we really need it to be a very edge on system to see this effect. Um, here you have, uh, it, we're defining superior conjunction happening at orbital phase of 0.25, uh, where that big spike is. Um, the dotted lines represent the full Shapiro delay signal, but the solid line is what we're actually able to observe. So this is the absor uh, absorbed Shapiro delay signal, um, which is what happens when we don't have the, the mass and inclination angles a priori. Um, and the best way to measure Shapiro delay is by observing in these orange circles. So you want to just look at the full extent of the Shapiro delay signal. Um, and unfortunately, that's a very uh, sort of specific observing request. So getting this observing time is a little bit tough. So a tiny bit of history. In 2010, Demarest et al. published uh, this really kind of groundbreaking result. Um, the mass of 1614 uh, was reported to be approximately two solar masses. This was a very big deal, obviously. Um, uh, 1614 is a nanograph pulsar, and we now measure the mass to be about 1.93 solar masses, so still a very massive uh, neutron star. And from that result, they were able to uh, make certain constraints on the equation of state, uh, which was a very big deal. The next kind of very massive neutron star was from Antoniadis et al. in 2013. Um, that was even slightly more massive. Uh, though not through uh, that measurement, wasn't made through Shapiro delay observations. Um, the other thing I'll mention is that within the nanograph data set, uh, there's a publication from uh, Fonseca et al. 2016, measuring 
significant Shapiro delay in 14 of Nanograd's binaries. And it, you know, they span this large mass range, which is extremely helpful uh, for, for constraining the equation of state. Um, and so from 1.18 to 1.93 solar masses, a pretty big range. So OSM40 plus 6620 was uh, found in 2014. It's a pretty normal millisecond pulsar. Uh, nanograbs have been timing it since 2014. Um, and after a few years of observations, it started to show this hint of Shapiro delay, but our constraint was really, really poor. And so we decided that what we needed to do was conduct some targeted observations uh, using the Green Bank Telescope. And so the first thing we did was just do a long scan over conjunction uh, in order to yield a better mass measurement. And so that um, supplementary observation in combination with the nanograph data set uh, yielded a mass of 2.18 plus or minus 0.15 solar masses. And so again, uh, you know, pretty exciting, but we needed, we needed a better measurement than that. Um, and so we went about trying to convince uh, the, the TAC that a little bit more time would be extraordinarily helpful. And we basically showed that the nanograph timing program, we don't get to pick at what orbital phase our observations occur. So um, because they're completely ran randomly distributed, we figured out that even over the span of five years, we wouldn't get a particularly good constraint on the mass. Um, and we also uh, were able to verify that, you know, the assumption that observations in the Shapiro delay troughs as well as over conjunction are the best way to constrain a uh, Shapiro delay. Um, so we were able to get that supplementary time. We got five hours over conjunction and five hours in one of the Shapiro delay troughs. Uh, and so combining, combining those two supplementary data sets with the nanograph data set um, yielded a mass of 2.14 plus or minus 0 0.09 solar masses. That's one sigma. Um, and so 0740 plus 6620 uh, is very likely to be the most massive neutron star. Um, so this was a, a very exciting result. And I'm not going to talk too much about the implications. Um, on the right, you can see just a sort of nice summary plot of the, of the extent of the Shapiro delay signal, what we're able to, to detect. OK, so you know, in the same way, we know that this higher mass measurement uh, calls into question many of the exotic theories, things like perk matter and hyperons. Um, it, there are also some interesting astrophysical implications. I mean, if we're detecting a bunch of almost two solar mass neutron stars, but we know that much less massive uh, millisecond pulsars are fully recycled, then that suggests maybe some of these sources are born massive in the first place. Um, there's also slight tension with this. I'm not going to go too much into detail, uh, but by measuring the binary orbital period and the companion mass, of the white dwarf, uh, suggests that the system was born in a low metallicity environment. Um, and you can see from the right, I mean, th this is a very helpful uh, constraint on the equation of state, but it would really be beneficial to improve our measurement um, of the mass. And so that's what we've been trying to do. Um, Emmanuel Fonseca, who I mentioned before, uh, just published this paper on 0740. It's updated um, mass measurements. It adds uh, a year and a half of both GBT nanograv data and Can Canadian hydrogen intensity mapping experiment, CHIME data. Um, and CHIME is really phenomenal because we're able to get extremely high cadence with CHIME. You can see on the bottom right residual plot uh, just how much the observing cadence picked up um, uh, you know, right at the end of the data set there. And that actually introduced some complications, but we'll get to that. Um, this work is very interesting because it presents the first significant measurement of uh, PV dot, binary orbital period derivative. Um, and this actually helps to serve as a consistency check uh, with the distance derived from parallax, because we know that, you know, all the effects that cause either you know, an actual PV dot or, or the appearance of PV dot um, kind of come down to the, the mass of the two bodies as well as the distance to the object. And so um, that means that we're able to get two different measurements of the distance. You can see that they are in very good agreement, um, the PDF in the top right. Uh, so, so that was a really nice result. Um, the complication that I was talking about on the last slide with the increased observing cadence is basically that uh, our modeling of dispersion measure um, 
you know, we often use DMX uh, in Nanograv at least. It's this like kind of epoch by epoch piecewise linear uh, fit to the dispersion measure. And so um, how you bin that, how, how you decide to split up those DMX bins um, makes a difference. And so there were three different kind of methods tried and, uh, you know, I mean, you'll use Bayesian model averaging over those three models in order to um, derive the results. And so the, the combined result is for the mass, sorry, the constraint on the mass is 2.08 plus or minus 0.07 solar masses. And so this was really phenomenal. You know, we're not particularly surprised that the mass got revised down a little bit, but it's great because the lower limit is actually pretty much unchanged from the Cromarty et al. result. And so uh, that was really wonderful to see. The improved distance helps with a lot of things, um, uh, especially the nicer modeling, but we're going to hear about that from others later. Um, it also, you know, there's some interesting uh, analyses that you can do with white dwarf cooling curves, but I won't, I won't get into it too much. Um, but as I said, uh, the, this updated measurement of the mass and distance are, are really important for uh, nicer analyses. So uh, to end, I'm going to talk about Shapiro delay observations of one more source, and this is actually not a nanograv one, but it is of particular interest to nicer. So 1231 minus 1411 is the brightest uh, gamma ray millisecond pulsar. Um, the X-ray light curve suggested that the source might be slightly, you know, kind of a less massive source. Um, the goal is to use, you know, very much like it is for OSM40 to use Shapiro delay derived masses uh, to improve NICER's ability to measure the radius of the neutron star. Um, and so what we did, we combined 22 additional hours kind of, you know, very much in the same way as OSM40, did some of these supplemental observations over conjunction, um, combined it with lots of historical NLSE data, um, as well as some archival GBT data. And when we put these all together, you know, Sorry, Sorry no, you're good. A few more minutes. Okay, okay, yeah, I'm almost finished. Take um, it's fine. <laughs> okay, uh, so, you know, when we combine these data sets together, um, these are very preliminary results, so don't, you know, take them with a very large grain of salt, uh, but, you know, we do see that it's at a high inclination angle of about 82 degrees, um, and that it is not a notably massive millisecond pulsar. Um, our constraint on the mass is not great. You can see that um, it's 1.7 plus or minus 0.5 solar masses. This is, you know, just again, uh, to suggest what we're seeing, but not finalized results by any means. Um, and so we, uh, for this study of 1231 minus 1411, um, we're able to derive some priors from actual uh, astrophysics. So we know that because of this Taurus and Savonia relationship, um, that, that describes the relationship between the binary orbital period and the mass of the white dwarf in the system. Um, we're able to put a kind of physically motivated prior on the mass of the companion. Um, and then we also assume a, a random distribution of inclination angles, so a flat in cosine of inclination prior. Um, and we're doing it in two different ways. We're using uh, MCMC sampling as well as just kind of normal chi-squared gridding and, and our results are agreeing very well. And the last thing I'll mention is that uh, there's a very long uh, Fermi data set, a uh, gamma ray data set on this source, um, something like you know, 10 or 12 years data. Um, so I won't get into the technique, but suffice to say the Fermi data unfortunately do not um, constrain uh, the, the mass. And so we're unable to use those, but we're still hoping, hoping that the um, mass derived from the radio analysis uh, is going to be informative for NACER. And so uh, that is something to look forward to, I think. And I will leave my summary there and take questions. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Thankful. That was really excellent. Um, there's already a question from David Sang. David, Dave, would you like me to um, ask the question or should, are you okay? I, I can, yeah, okay, I, I think that was a great talk. Um, just out of curiosity, uh, I've just been reading about uh, 1713 uh, behaving badly. How much is that going to mess up things for uh, PTAs? 
you're really bringing up some heartbreaking sorry, stuff. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Huh? No, you're, I'm totally kidding. You're good. It's a really, really interesting question. Um, we are grappling with it right now. So it is actually a pretty big problem, right? I mean, so uh, what he's referring to is that we just recently saw um, a very significant change in the pulse profile of 1713, which is this very important nanograph pulsar. It's, it's really important for pulse timing. It's precisely timed. We've been timing it over a long time span. And so uh, it, it is very helpful in contributing sensitivity to gravitational waves. Um, but if we're not able to have, you know, if it doesn't have a stable pulse profile and, and it's changing kind of randomly, uh, that's a really big problem for our timing precision and, and for the templates we use to extract the times of arrival, the time of arrival measurements. And so um, we are actually currently conducting a DDT campaign uh, with the VLA to continue to monitor those, those profile changes and see if we ever see a recovery. Um, but we're certainly worried about it. Uh, it. It, you know, not just for the sake of 1713, but it sort of makes us think, you know, do we need to be monitoring profile changes in all of our millisecond pulsars much more closely? You know, this is a big problem for 1713 because it is so precisely timed. Um, I wouldn't say that it's messing up the PTA, but it is, uh, you know, kind of helping us revise a. Uh, uh, um, how we think about about some of these sources. Um, it's interesting though, it's astrophysically very interesting because uh, the, the change is probably something intrinsic to the pulsar itself, uh, but we're not quite sure what's going on yet. Yeah, that's the great thing about the noise actually being interesting astrophysically, yes, of these systems. So like, yeah, that's the positive spin. <laughs> um, Ma Madapa Prakash, please go ahead. It's a question. Yeah. Is NICER somehow, will NICER somehow be able to get a better handle on the mass? Yeah, so I, I actually don't want to spoil too much because we've structured this session so that, you know, I'm just talking about radio observations, but the NICER folks are going to dive into detail. Um, uh, we do think that being able to provide them with priors on, on parameters like the, the mass of the pulsar and the distance um, are going to help them in refining their radius measurement. Uh, but we're about to hear a bunch about it. So I don't mean to uh, avoid answering your question, but I think there's gonna be lots more information about it. I'm more interested in uh, the restriction of mass. 0.5 solar masses is a big error about there. Yes. Um, Sorry, go ahead, thank you. No, you go ahead, sorry. No, 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 it's for you, it's a question for you. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, it's it's not a hundred percent clear. Um, yeah, so I guess what I'll say is that in order to improve our error bars that we're getting from radio Shapiro delay, um, you know, this could be helped with more targeted campaigns. Um, you are definitely correct that 0.5 is a very bad error bar on the mass. Um, and so from my perspective, I would be interested in continuing to time this source uh, in the radio um, and, and trying to refine the mass measurement. But again, I mean, it's not the most highly inclined system. Um, and so there is going to be a limit to, to how well we can measure, measure that mass. But you're absolutely correct in that, that it's not a very impressive uh, constraint, so. Thank you so much, Thankful. Um, that was a really wonderful talk. I think on that perfect note and that last question um, from Adapa Prakash, we should go on to the nicer talk. So um, I will ask Slavko if you can try to share your screen. Yes. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Um, okay, perfect. And so, but I can't see your screen yet. Yes, I'm working on. One okay, second. that was my fault. I'm sorry, I forgot to stop sharing. Uh, and Madaka, share I think screen. your hand is still up if you want to take it down. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, our next talk will be about NISA. And so it's a great pleasure to introduce Slavko Bogdanov, who will be talking to us about measuring the neutron star equation of state with NISA. So please go ahead, Slav. Thank, thank you, you. Samir. Um, so thank you, all the organizers, for setting up this meeting, which uh, I guess was supposed to be last year. And it was looking forward to being in Italy, but you know, it is what it is. So, but 
Uh, so I'm going to give an overview, kind of set up uh, the necessary background for the next two talks and talk about the, the nicer uh, X-ray timing instrument. And the work I'll be discussing uh, will be uh, is based on work by all these wonderful people listed at the bottom. Um, so I'm speaking on behalf of all of them. Uh, so I guess for this meeting, I don't need to really motivate why we want to do these measurements since uh, it's kind of preaching to the choir. Uh, but you know, just to uh, quickly summarize, you know, we clearly, you know, understanding uh, the composition of neutron stars is very important for both astrophysical reasons and for kind of nuclear physics reasons. Uh, so the kind of uncertainty and kind of their core composition uh, is stems from the fact that we don't really understand uh, nuclear physics in in that particular regime of low temperatures uh, and high uh, densities. Uh, but we can invert the problem and say, you know, neutron stars occupy uh, this interesting region of phase space. So by observing neutron stars with a variety uh, of techniques, we can in principle deduce what the behavior of matter is in this regime. Uh, and you know that's, as others have already mentioned, that's possible because there's a mapping between the mass radius relation of neutron stars and the pressure density uh, relation of matter. Uh, so we can use neutron stars as astrophysical labs to study uh, cold dense matter. And so thankful already mentioned kind of radius measurement from rad pulsar timing kind of provide one constraint on the uh, mass radius relation. Uh, and that's primarily uh, for the high mass stars. Uh, but uh, it would be good, you know, ideally we want to combine these measurements with techniques that offer insight into the radius of the neutron star. And from there, uh, uh, generate even more interesting constraints on what the plausible uh, uh, equation of state of nuclear matter is. Uh, so, you know, there's a multitude of theoretically well motivated possibilities of what the mass radius relation could be. Uh, so, we were a really narrow, restrict this parameter space as much as possible so we can gain some insight. Uh, so yesterday we talked about gravitational wave uh, uh, approaches to constraining the equation, neutron star equation of state through double neutron star mergers. So here I'm going to talk about uh, one possible technique that uses electromagnetic observations of neutron stars and is specifically using uh, extra observations with the neutron star Interior Composition Explorer, which is a NASA Explorer mission uh, that's been operating on the space station since 2017. Uh, so it's an attached payload on the space station, and it's actually the most productive uh, scientific instrument on the space station by far, by like orders of magnitude in terms of scientific productivity. Um, so. Uh, so quickly, just to summarize, it's a it's a dedicated mission uh, that's uh, operating in the soft X-ray band. Um, and kind of one of its defining characteristics is its phenomenal uh, absolute timing resolution of better than a hundred nanoseconds. Uh, has comparable to CCD resolution um, in the soft X-rays. It's a non-imaging instrument, so it collects uh, all photons within six arc minute field of view. Uh, has pretty low background, it's quite sensitive, and in comparison it's about, has twice the effective area of excellent Newton, uh, and uh, you know with comparable background and you know high tolerance for for high count rates. Um, but it's also at the same time it's it has the sensitivity to observe these millisecond pulsars which tend to be very faint. Um, and the advantage also is because it's it's a small mission with a specific focus. It's possible to generate to to accumulate a lot more data than is possible, for example, with XMM, which is a kind of a multi-purpose facility. So uh, we're able to get uh, 
data over millions of seconds as opposed to a few hundred kiloseconds here and there. Uh, so that's kind of gives us the advantage to uh, to get much higher quality data than would be possible with a general purpose observatory like XMM. Um, so as the name of the mission suggests, it's you know its main goal is to constrain the occasion of state of bulk nuclear matter uh, using extra observations of, of neutron stars and in particular the millisecond pulsars that thankful was just talking about. Uh, and to do this, we make use of this so-called pulse profile modeling technique. Uh, and you know the the appeal of millisecond these rotation powered millisecond pulsars is that even though they're fairly faint as far as neutron stars go in X-rays, uh, they're fair, they're all relatively nearby. Uh, most of their emissions seems to be coming from hot spots on the surface, which are likely associated with the magnetic polar caps of the neutron stars. So there's some backflow of, of electrons or positrons raining down from the magnetosphere onto the polar caps and heat them to uh, millions of degrees, uh, which are observed in X-rays. They also have very low, fairly low magnetic fields based on their spin down measurements, uh, which makes the modeling of the of their surface emission much more uh, straightforward because uh, we don't need to uh, uh, account for uh, kind of strong magnetic field effects uh, that are uh, that arise at higher magnetic field. And the other uh, nice feature is that they're non-transient in terms of that they're always the flux is steady and it's always on. So so you don't have to wait for outbursts and things. you can just observe them over long periods of time. And because they're rotationally stable, you can then fold uh, the X-ray data set on the extremely precise radio timing ephemerides and obtain these pulse profiles. Uh, so this is just a general overview of the technique. So, uh, you know, you have this rotating neutron star, uh, you know, you construct some, uh, you have to account for all the atmospheric effects and also the photon propagation along the line of sight uh, as the photon uh, travels from the deep uh, gravitational potential to the observer uh, then you need to account for all the things that happen along the way uh, so then you construct this pulse profile synthetic pulse profile as a function of phase and energy uh, you interface that with the performance of the instruments of the photons incident on the detector are, you know, are, uh, are affected by the performance of the telescope detecting them. And then we interface all of that with these uh, sophisticated uh, likelihood calculations and statistical sampling codes to then deduce the mass radius and then also the equation of state. So the reason, one reason that we use millisecond pulsars uh, is uh, so one, there's a the emission seems to arise from very small, from fairly small spots on the surface, and that the rotation of those of the star, the changing view of the hot spots will give you these pulsations. So at each each rotation, you get something like this, uh, and then because of uh, GR, you uh, you have information about the mass and radius relation. Uh, ratio encoded in the pulse profile. As you can see in weak gravity, uh, the spot is occulted uh, in this configuration, but for the same configuration with strong gravity, you can see that the actual, you can see from behind the star. So the spot is always visible. Um, and then the additional advantage of the rapid spin is that you have additional information about the radius uh, because due to the rapid spin, you have additional special relativistic effects like Doppler boosting and aberration uh, that are apparent. Uh, and you can also see that in the change of the color of the spot um, and the general shape of the spot also, of the, of the pulse profile because of that. And because for a larger star at a given rotation rate, a spot on the surface will have to move faster to complete one rotation compared to a more compact star, that provides you separate information about just the radius alone. And that's why you're able to disentangle the mass and the radius with this kind of measurement uh, instead of just the mass to radius ratio uh, if you were to use uh, slowly rotating stars. And so the general technique is, you know, it's pretty, has been 
examined quite a bit over the past few decades. Uh, as you can see, there are tons of publications that deal with this, and you can uh, uh, you can read all of those. Um, so you know, you have a spot uh, on the surface, and because of GR, a non-radially emitted photon will follow a curved trajectory. Uh, so if it's emitted at an angle alpha, it will be observed at an angle psi that is larger than alpha. Um, then you know you need to you can plug in all the uh, you know if you assume Schwarzschild geometry, then uh, you can also then. Uh, which will account for the gravitational redshift and uh, photon light bending. Uh, but then you have to kind of manually include also the special relativistic effects like the Doppler boosting and aberration. Um, and also because the time scale of the rotation is pretty small, so you have to actually account for the fact that a photon on the near side of the star and the photon on the far side uh, of the star moving towards the observer will actually have different travel times because of that extra length. Uh, so, so that is something we also have to take into account. And so this is the, some of the code that we'll discuss uh, in the following talks. So, uh, so our analysis have been done by two groups independently, uh, one led by Tom Riley and Anna Watts at Amsterdam, uh, and one led by Cole Miller uh, at the University of Maryland and Fred Lamb uh, at the University of Illinois. So this is just shows some different ways of how you can parameterize uh, kind of an, an emitting region on the surface of a rotating neutron star with kind of varying degrees of complexity. Uh, and just uh, you increase the complexity until you and you know end up with a satisfactory uh, model that fits your data adequately. And and these are set up so that each the each complex model, the other, the previous simpler models are subset of the more complex model. And this is similarly the in the Illinois Maryland code. You have this uh, setup where also uh, the additional feature here is that the spots can also be elongated, uh, kind of be oval and with kind of any aspect ratio and oriented in any direction uh, on the surface. So. The other feature is so we have the we're assuming a Schwarzschild geometry uh, for the space time around the star, uh, which is pretty good for even for these fairly rapidly rotating neutron stars. Uh, and the one feature that actually becomes important, kind of at the level of precision that we're looking for, is that these stars become appreciably oblate to their rapid spin. Uh, so in that case, so that's kind of the next uh, important effect that figures into the analysis. So we, uh, we can't assume a spherical star because then the deviations uh, from the exact solution become fairly large, kind of larger than what uh, the measurement uh, we're accuracy we desire. Uh, but luckily, Sharon Marsing and collaborators have developed this so-called oblate Schwarzschild uh, approximation where you still assume that the space-time is Schwarzschild, uh, but you just embed a, a, an oblate star into it. And that seems to take care of a lot of the discrepancies between this, just the normal spherical Schwarzschild star and uh, the exact numerical solution. Um, and so one other thing to, uh, I think, yeah, oops. Yeah, so this, this actually shows that effect. So if you account for the oblateness of the star, uh, you you remove a lot of the difference from the exact numerical solution, and that's what we have done. So we and there's these uh, good uh, approximation, like simple formulas to account for the oblateness of the of the star as a as a or kind of the radius of the star as a function of collatitude on the surface, so that it's there's the radius is smaller on the poles than on the equator, right? Uh, and this just going back to the earlier point that this just shows how the, what the importance of uh, of rapid spin is on the mass radius constraint. So you can see this is the top two panels are for slowly rotating star, and the difference between the left and the right is that one has a really tiny spot, uh, hot spot on the surface of 0.01 radians, and the other one has one radian. Uh, and the bottom shows if you had a 600 hertz star, then you really constrict the the 
parameter space dramatically. Um, and in the top panels, you see you basically mostly constrain the mass to radius ratio, uh, whereas uh, in the bottom panels, you actually get separate information uh, about the mass and the radius. So that's why the, the kind of the credible regions shrink them dramatically. And it, it seems to help a little bit to have tinier spots on the star than larger spots um, for reasons that, you know, it's are not, uh, I can go into later. Uh, and that just shows that, you know, because the stars are rapidly rotating, there is some effect on the actual mass radius relation on the equation of state of the interior, right? So, but it just shows that the effect is, is fairly minor and it's, uh, you know, it's, you know, this is at a level where our measurements are nowhere for, you know, is good enough to actually be able to distinguish these two. But this just shows that, you know, we have these in mind. It's just that they're not at a level where it uh, makes a huge difference. Um, so the, the one in, important ingredient also is kind of having a, a good model of the emission properties of the surface. So here we have good reason to believe that there's probably a atmosphere composed of hydrogen on the surface. Uh, and we have these uh, hydrogen atmosphere models available, uh, which uh, kind of a key feature of the hydrogen atmospheres is that uh, uh, they, ex unlike black bodies, uh, they, you know, they, they exhibit limb darkening. So that's something you have, to, and it's energy dependent. So these atmosphere models uh, that have been developed over the past few decades uh, are, uh, you know, are, are pretty sophisticated and we make use of use of the latest ones available uh, developed by Winho and collaborators. And so one kind of leading up to the nicer mission, we spend a lot of time making sure that our codes to kind of do all the ray tracing and, uh, uh, you know, the emission modeling and everything kind of end to end that they all produce reliable results. So we've done cross comparisons between multiple codes uh, just to see that we all get the same answer, uh, which was not obvious before the fact. Uh, and we found that, you know, they all agree to exquisite precision kind of down at the level that is required for these measurements. Um, so we're happy to report. A few more okay. okay, thank you. Yeah, and we also done a lot of uh, synthetic data sets where we construct uh, kind of a realistic millisecond pulsar X-ray uh, pro pulse profile and see if the two independent analyses can recover the correct answer. And uh, and you know this was it you know, was kind of years in development. These kind of custom codes to uh, that are. Uh, kind of tailored to this problem because we found a lot of kind of canned uh, samplers uh, available out there were actually not suitable for what we were trying to do for a variety of reasons. And then, so these are the targets we've selected for this, uh, for these measurements. Uh, and you recognize a couple of them are the ones Thankful was talking about. So 740, the most massive pulsar and also 1231. Um, and so the advantage of using these objects is, you know, as Thankful mentioned, you have the possibilities of independent mass measurements from radio timing, and you can also get pretty accurate uh, distances to these objects. So I think 0437, the first one here, the nearest one, has the best measured distance of any object outside of the solar system. Uh, so, so that's very helpful for these kinds of analyses. Um, and so the two in bold face are the ones that we've already analyzed, and the next two talks are going to be about those 740. Uh, and this is just to give you a sense of the quality of data we get. Uh, so this is kind of the previously best available profile from XMM Newton, and this is what we get with NICER. So it's, you have a huge increase in signal to noise uh, because we have a dedicated mission to collect these data over many years. Uh, this is just another one that just shows you the kind of the substantial increase in quality of data. And so, and this is the two dimensional kind of pulse phase as a function of energy uh, diagrams, which is, which is what we analyze. So we, we model the pulse profiles as a function of energy um, in these objects. 
so this is the first set of results that were published in at the end of 2019. So this is uh, JW30 plus 0451. Uh, and this is an isolated pulsar, so there is no possibility of getting an independent mass measurement. Uh, but we can see, you know, we do get some information about the mass also. It's just not particularly constraining. Uh, but, you know, these, this is the current kind of uh, the level of measurement we're, we're currently getting with these objects. So this is from Cole's pa uh, paper led by Cole, um, where I, you know, you can uh, read all about. Uh, so that's the mass radius constraint and that's the pressure density constraint here. Uh, and this is the same object uh, analyzed by Tom Riley and collaborators. So uh, you get consistent results for the mass and radius. Uh, and the interesting thing here is we also get information about the arrangement of the of the surface emission on the star. So we're getting these pretty peculiar uh, hotspot geometries, which are not consistent with just a standard di magnetic dipole, uh, which is interesting in and of itself for as far as kind of understanding magnetic fields of neutron stars and evolution and all that. So, so we get other kind of interesting information. And this is uh, the constraints from those uh, results uh, by the Amsterdam team and others uh, on the pressure density relation. Um, and they'll talk about that in more detail. So this just shows kind of what the magnetic configuration of the J030 source might be and you can see it's it's very strange uh, and um, so that's kind of additional information we actually get this for free uh, in these kinds of analyses uh, so just you know kind of you know when i look out to the future so nicer will continue to observe these targets for the next few years but kind of there's in the next generation of observatories we you know there's the possibilities to kind of do you know get much better measurements, but also get a lot more of them too. So there's several uh, observatories on the horizon that's what, where this can be accomplished. Uh, and, you know, that's important with kind of both getting many more uh, measurements, but also getting, uh, using multiple techniques to kind of mitigate systematics. Uh, so that's kind of something to look forward to in the next decade. Uh, so I just wanted to throw that out there. Uh, so the future is bright, I think, uh, in this field. So I think we're just getting started. Um, so I'll just leave out the conclusions and um, I guess just quickly mention that, you know, we use these objects kind of, they seem the best suited for this purpose. Uh, and we've developed all this machinery to analyze this data. And it's, it's a very challenging type of analysis, but I think we've uh, made a lot of progress and kind of, uh, kind of making it happen. Uh, so we're on track to doing these, to delivering multiple plus or minus 10% mass radius constraints. Uh, so, and, you know, as along the way, we're still examining potential sources of systematic uh, error, which are, you know, we're trying to get a handle on as much as possible. Uh, so, uh, and, you know, the next two talks will we'll kind of take it from here. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Slavko. Really, really great talk and really appreciate um, yeah, introducing NISA to us all. Um, so I will quickly open the floor to any questions. Please don't hesitate to raise your hand with the, um, the hands up sign or else write in the chat. Are there any questions for Slavko? So one, oh, okay, yes, sorry, they're all coming. Um, so Jocelyn, please go ahead. Jocelyn Reed. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yep. yep. Um, so I, I had a question when you showed the, the lower nose, noise on the pulse profile modeling, the, the curve still had sort of a jaggedness to it. Is there uh, any idea why? I think some of, so there's, I mean, there's still a lot of like, you know, it doesn't go to zero, right? So, so there's still a lot of background in there. Uh, well, I, I mean, it was more, the lines sort of wiggle, you know, abrupt. Yeah, I think part of it is like, um, 
aliasing effect when you bin it. So because it rises oh, okay. quickly, so you get kind of a step kind of function, you know, like step thing. You know, it's weird. It, we've, you know, we've done these kind of to check whether like the variance of the, you know, of the of the day of the kind of wiggles is it consistent with just Poisson fluctuations, right? Or if it just, you know, because if it's not, then there's an actual real feature, and they all seem. This all seems to be consistent within, you know, kind of the distribution you would ex expect. So in this many bins, you do expect like one bin to be off by like three sigma or something like that. So it's not, uh, I think it's it's definitely, you know, kind of, it's natural to look as like, oh, that's that bump looks weird. But then if you do the statistics, then it's like, you can't really say that it's like, oh, it's a real bump or is it just a fluctuation, right? So. Um, so yeah, so we definitely thought about all of that. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jocelyn. Um, young girl? Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Um, we can't hear you very well. Um, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, now, thanks. Go ahead. Uh, uh, yes, uh, thanks for your talk. I, uh, I'm, I'm curious that you mentioned the thermal uh, components of the X-ray. So I I want to know uh, there are the non-thermal components right in the X-ray. Uh, yeah. So uh, so uh, so why we don't consider this component? Does it uh, uh, mean that it uh, affects uh, affects the uh, profile very little? Or yeah. So we uh, looked at that. So we it's, it's there might be a non-thermal. So in a lot of other pulsars, you see non-thermal emission that's due to like particle acceleration in the magnetosphere, right? Uh, so we've looked for that kind of emission in, in the band we're looking for. And it does seem to be at a level where it's not contributing much to the, uh, to the total emission. But it's, you know, if it's, we don't think it's, it doesn't seem to be at a level where it's affecting the shape of the profile. Uh, but it, you know, it's possible that it's there. It's just for, it seems for these, millisecond pulsars, the thermal part component in the soft X-rays is kind of orders mm -hmm. of magnitude stronger than the thermal components, than the non-thermal component. So, uh, whereas that's not the case for other types of pulsars, like kind of normal pulsars, uh, or like younger normal pulsars. Like, you know, if you think of the crab where it's basically all non-thermal, right? So. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Slavko. One question I just had was more of a practical one. So you mentioned that um, you have another handful of targets that NICE yep. look at. So what's limiting, I mean, given how amazing um, and the results have been from NICE so far, what's limiting the addition of extens extending the NICE emission as well as extending that list, basically? Uh, so part of it is, so in the early mission, because it was like a, uh, a dedicated mission, it was doing a lot of observations of these targets. But now a lot of the time is dedicated to the guest observer program. So it's harder to accumulate more data for all of these targets. We're still doing it. It's just, you know, there's other considerations now. Uh, and as far as like how long the NICER mission can be extended, uh, you know, it's there's a senior review coming up uh, that will decide. So I think as of now, NICER is approved until 2023. Uh, and then for the next senior review, which is gonna be at the end of this year, I believe, uh, they all decide if it gets extended more. And then the extra consideration, and there's some like political things happening with the space station, where I think the Russians are considering removing their part of the space station and going their own separate ways, uh, and which I think is gonna be, like, the timeline is like 2024, 25. So if that happens, then that's that, you know, who knows what's going to happen after that. Uh, so it's so I think the next kind of, you know, thing that might result in the end of NICER is whether the they'll decommission the space station. That's that's really the next because, uh, as you know, as I said, NICER is an extremely productive experiment. I think in the most productive experiment on the space station uh, in terms of scientific output. So. So the space station people really love nicer. Uh, so it's, I think it will come down to politics really of how long it gets extended. So. 
Thank you. And I did want to ask you about the magnetic field geometry, but I'm going to leave that now because we are running behind time, yeah. but we're not okay. really everyone because um, of the discussion session. We are yep. we do have no problem. A new yep. way. But I will um, really congratulate you and the NICER team for all these amazing results, Slavka, and thank, thank you too. for um, being here today. Um, and we'll move on to the next NICER talk, which will be by Professor Cole Miller from the University of Maryland. Thank you, Cole. Thank you, Slavko. All right. Thank you, Samaya, and good afternoon, everyone. Indeed, we do have a good sequence of talks here. I'm going to present the work by our group on measuring the radius of the heavy pulsar, which Thankful described in some detail. This is a fairly straightforward talk. I'll begin by describing our results and how we got them for this particular heavy 2.1 solar mass neutron star. And then I'll talk a little bit about the implications of this result for the equation of state of the matter in neutron star cores. As you heard from Slavko, there are two separate groups within the NICER team that have been <clears throat> working on this and the other pulsars. It's, it's good to have the independent efforts and checks. And I'm going to focus on the results from our group which has recently been accepted in FJ Letters. But also please do pay careful attention to the next talk by Herrick Rymakers, where he's going to discuss their take on the implications for the properties of high density matter from this pulsar and the previous NICE pulsar as well. The main results, just as a summary, Slavko did mention some of the work that we had done earlier on pulsar J0030, about 200 Hertz, about 1.4 solar masses. Here we have a case where we did not have independent information about the mass or about the observer inclination, which are very helpful pieces of info. But even with that, we got radii of about 13 plus or minus one kilometers and roughly 1.44 plus or minus 0.15 solar masses. And I think that this at least partially answers Prakash's question, which he had asked of Thankful, uh, which is, could NICER possibly get better constraints on the mass of something like 1231? I'd say the prospects are there, although we have not done the analysis yet. And that's because 1231, although not as bright as J0030, is maybe 60 or 70% of the count rate. So I think there are some possibilities there. For the heavy pulsar, here, as I'll emphasize, we are critically dependent on the radio work done by Thankful and her colleagues. This is what we get for the mass, which is entirely from the radio. The radius measurement that we find is between about 12 and 16 kilometers at plus or minus one sigma. And this, you may notice, is a broader range than what we had for J0030 even though we have the extra information of the mass and the observer inclination to the orbital plane of the system. Why is that? Well, because J0740 has about 5% the count rate of J0030, so that spreads it out. Another thing you may notice is, geez, 16 kilometers is a lot. Our philosophy here is that when we are reporting the results of the analysis of the NICER and also XMM, x-ray data, that we're just allowing the radius to be whatever value fits the data. So that's the strict reporting of the radius. However, when we think about the implications for the equation of state of very dense matter, then we bring in other considerations, including nuclear priors and tidal deformabilities. We heard from Slavko about the importance of radii, and just to emphasize that a bit more, here is another figure from the same Demarest et al. 2010 paper that Thankful featured. This was the first report of a roughly two solar mass neutron star. And what you see on the right is their take of a variety of specific proposed equations of state and their mass radius curves. And you see that even among those that meet the criterion of being able to reach two solar masses, there's quite a wide variety of radii. Indeed, when I have talked with nuclear physicists and I've asked them if there were a single quantity you could measure with precision and reliability for a neutron star, what would it be? Most of them say the radius. For this reason, there's a lot of leverage, but this is very tough to measure, much tougher than it is to measure the mass. Indeed, there has been a lot of work because of the desirability of radii trying to estimate the radius. However, 
the majority of published measurements which were based on such x-ray observations are unfortunately subject, at least possibly, to very large systematic errors in the following insidious sense. It is possible to get something that looks like an excellent statistical fit to the data, but that is nonetheless biased by 40 or 50% in some cases. This is where nicer X-ray pulse modeling can help in a dramatic way. And in particular, work that I've done with Fred Lamb and our colleagues over the past several years suggests that there's a critical extra dimension of nicer like data that can remove many of the concerns about systematic error. That extra dimension is that instead of simply looking at the X-ray spectrum, we're able to get the spectrum as a function of the rotational phase due to the outstanding timing of nicer. And it appears that when this extra dimension is included, systematic errors are minimized. We have reached this conclusion by looking at a number of ways in which the actual true star can differ from the models that we use in interpreting the data. We can generate synthetic data with different beaming spectra, spot shapes, and so on, and analyze them using our standard model. And what we find is that if there is a good statistical fit, there is no significant bias. Obviously, there are many ways that you could have systematic bias, but this is what has led to our cautious optimism that the nicer results are not just precise, but they are also reliable, which is rather important. As you heard from Slavko, the nicer idea in brief is that we imagine that we have a star with some hotter regions on it, which we can call hot spots. These rotate with the star and they emit in x-rays, soft x-rays in particular. And we are able for a given mass, radius, rotation rate, spot configuration, temperature, et cetera, to then predict what we would see in the x-ray data. And being good Bayesians, we use that to compute the likelihood of the data given the model. And we do a lot of sampling to figure out the most probable regions for each of the parameters in the model. The results for the heavy pulsar J0740 is shown here. As I indicated, the radius at one sigma that we find is roughly 12 to 16 kilometers. The corner plot is on the left. You see the radius in the top left and the mass in the bottom right, where the dotted line is the prior that we have obtained from Thankful and her colleagues. And boy, do you ever see the importance of this prior because the gray histograms are what we get after using that prior and analyzing things using the X-ray data. And you see that it has barely moved. Without the radio measurements, we would have in this particular case, a fairly decent measurement of the compactness, the ratio of the mass to the radius, but not the radius separately. By the way, as Slavko indicated in one of his slides, there is a persistent myth that the compactness is in all circumstances going to be the quantity best determined. That's not always true in general. One of the slides he showed indicated there are cases in which you might in fact get a fractionally better constraint on the radius than the compactness but not in this case. So here we really do need the external measurement of the mass and the orbital inclination from radio measurements. Our modeling of the hotspots, as Slavko indicated, we try to be as flexible as possible. We allow there to be two, three, four spots if necessary. We allow the spots to have circular or oval shapes with arbitrary orientations. And we allow the spots to overlap each other or not, depending on what fits the data. And the overlap can be a cool on top of a hot spot or a hot on top of a cool spot. However, for J0740, we are lucky in that at least at this particular level of precision of data, all we need are two uniform temperature circular spots that are non-overlapping. That does make it a bit easier. We then, as I indicated, fold the pulse profile for a given combination of spots, sizes, locations, and temperatures, fold it through the responses, compare with data. And it is necessary to use not just the nicer data, but also the data from the ESA XMM Newton satellite. And that's because 
the XMM Newton satellite has a lower background. And by using its data, we're able to get a better idea of the total flux from the pulsar. And this is important in establishing the modulation fraction, which turns out to be critical for this particular pulsar. So here's a quick little movie, uh, similar to what we saw from Slavko, where you can see both poles because of gravitational light deflection. And those are the two spots, nice little spots. And these spots, as, as you can see, are ones that are not antipodal to each other, but they're pretty close to an offset dipole. So this is much closer to the textbook picture of the magnetic polar regions than the J0031 with its weird spot configuration. I mentioned that our investigations prior to NICER suggested that if you get a good statistical fit to the data with NICER type data, then you are not going to be significantly biased. And the good news is that the fit is statistically good. The test pattern that you see there shows a comparison of the best model with the nicer data. The vertical axis is the energy channel and the horizontal axis shows the rotational phase bin. We divide a rotational period into 32 phase bins and the color coding is chi, the signed square root of chi square. There are no patterns which are obvious. As I indicate in the text, the total chi-square per degree of freedom is consistent with the model being good. We also get consistency with the bolometric light curve from NICER and the XMM data. And therefore, taking a deep breath and assuming our previous investigations were indicative, it suggests that we might be able to draw conclusions from our fit. And what we find when we think about the equation of state is summarized here. And what I want to emphasize is that this is not the result we get for pressure versus number density just with the measurement of the heavy pulsar J0740. Instead, this is when you combine all of the information, various nuclear models. We have three equation of state models where we include the existence of heavy pulsars, tidal deformability, the previous nicer pulsar measurement, and then also the heavy measurement. The good news, I think, here is that what we see is that there is substantial convergence in the pressure density relation between these three models, overwhelmingly compared to the priors. I do have a spare slide if you wanted to see it. This, the priors are all over the place, but with all this information between maybe one and a half and five times nuclear saturation density, there's a tightening of the constraints that is very good to see. Another way of looking at that is to look at the mass radius constraints. In this particular case, we are using one of the three equation state frameworks. This is the one using Gaussian processes. And in each case, the pink band is the middle 90% of the probability for the radius at a given mass, and the blue band is the middle 50%. Uh, what we have here is in the top left, this is just using the priors in our equation state framework. Then we add nuclear symmetry energy constraints and the existence of heavy pulsars and tidal deformability in the top right the previous nicer pulsar bottom left, and then finally everything included in addition to our heavy pulsar in the bottom right. And what we see pretty clearly is that, this is good news, we have improvements as we add more information. And as you can see by looking at the top right and bottom right, in order to really tighten things up, the nicer data are quite important. What we find spanning all three of the equation of state frameworks that we have employed is that the plus minus one sigma radius range for a canonical 1.4 solar mass neutron star is between 11.8 and 13.1 kilometers, meaning this is plus or minus 5%, which is pretty impressive. But there's another thing that we can do, which is putting this on a bit more of a human scale, thanks to the excellent animators at NASA, we're going to show this look, but we're going to do it against a satellite image of Washington, DC. Many of you may notice the 
495 Beltway and possibly curse it depending on when you had to drive there. Here the inner circle represents the minus one sigma radius. The outer circle represents the plus one sigma radius. And we're again going from prior to pre-nicer to adding the first nicer pulsar to adding the second nicer pulsar. And what you see is that with only the priors, there's quite a wide range. Adding the pre-nicer information shrinks that range, then adding first the initial and then the more recent nicer pulsar has really shrunk this quite dramatically. Again, plus or minus 5% at this canonical 1.4 solar masses, which is pretty impressive given that we are measuring something the size of a city at a distance of thousands of light years. In conclusion, here are the radii of the two pulsars we have between roughly 12 and 16 kilometers for the heavy one, 12 and 14 for the previous one. These overlap, suggesting that there's not a dramatic push towards smaller radii at the higher masses. The equation of state at a few times nuclear saturation density is converging beautifully between the different models. And in terms of the radius, at least among the three equation of state frameworks we have examined, it's about plus or minus 5% at 1.4 solar masses. I want to echo some things that Slavko indicated about the future, because to quote a 1980s movie, greed, for the lack of a better word, is good in the sense that if we have a result, we want something better. So what is coming in the future? For the heavy pulsar, future observations are going to increase the number of nicer counts and for reasons that I didn't discuss, I think this should improve the upper limits, even if we're completely agnostic about the initial span. For nicer more generally, as Slavko indicated, there are other pulsars we're going to observe and better understanding of the instrument, as well as inclusion of other information should improve our first pulsars measurement as well. And then overall, in terms of our understanding of dense matter, in addition to this wonderful work that has been done by the NICER team in general, we have in the next decade, the promise of more events from gravitational waves, which are going to be able to give us tidal deformabilities, all of which is gonna to come together. We are in a data rich era about neutron star interiors. The prospects are bright. Thank you. And I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you, Cole. That was wonderful. Um, so I'm opening the floor for any questions. Um, please don't hesitate to um, raise your hands. I see Dave Tsang has put in the chat that he needs an arrow indicating the position of Cole, I think for your map of the DC um, Beltway. Okay, so Ingo has a question. Ingo, please go ahead. <laughs> Hi, Cole. Thank you very much for the great talk. I Thank wanted you. to ask, maybe you said it and I didn't catch it, but so you had now a prior for the mass of this object. Did you ever do the analysis releasing this prior and just seeing what happens if you wouldn't have known the mass of this neutron star? Yes, we did that early on, not our production level studies, of course, and pretty much what we have is the compactness for this pulsar. And therefore, the mass could be one solar mass as far as we know. Okay, so and it would be again this big ellipsis that you had oh, be, for the first? So. It'd be a giant, yeah. And the basic reason for that is the, even with 1.6 million seconds of nicer time, essentially what we can determine with nicer is the modulated flux. So how much does it change as opposed to details of the harmonics? And when you have the modulated flux and with XMM, you can get the total flux, you can therefore get the fractional modulation the thing that determines that is the compactness. But with additional harmonic information with more precise X-ray observations, then you could start getting more information and independently determine the mass and the radius as we did for J0030. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Thank you, um, Ingo. Um, Sumi Day has a question on the chat. Sumi, would you like to ask the question or I can read it out, whatever you prefer. Uh, so I can also ask the question. Uh, uh, so my question was that if you uh, have a plot uh, for how your uh, prior actually looks like for uh, uh, for the radius of uh, 1.4 solar mass uh, uh, neutron star, so it's like a uniform prior. 
uh, for uh, our uh, for a radius of uh, 1.4 solar mass neutron star. Oh, I see. Yes. So first of all, the, the top left here, it, this is the prior. So here you just can, can draw a line across here. So th this is what it is. In terms of the prior, we don't we don't specifically establish a prior on the radius. Uh, what we have done is that for an, a given equation of state, we have priors related to the central density. So it's not precisely uniform, but you can see that it's, it's quite broad. Okay. Uh, uh, great, thanks. Uh, and the other question that I uh, also had was that I was uh, also curious about uh, what could actually change in the approach of NICER in if we actually thought of making the uh, 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 radius measurements of NICER to align more with uh, the radius measurements observed by the GWs. So in order to like actually push the radii to more smaller values, what could have actually changed in the approach for nicer modeling? Well, when you talk about the approach, I guess what we have now is something that looks like a pretty good fit to the data. And therefore, it, it, in principle, if there were other models, spot models that, that were better fits, preferred statistically, and were to suggest lower radii, then that that might push it down. But I also want to emphasize that the there's not actually much tension between the gravitational wave results and the nicer results. There's a huge amount of overlap. Yeah. For example, at one sigma, 12 kilometers is perfectly fine for us for the 1.4 solar mass star J0030. And 12 kilometers is easily within the constraints from the gravitational wave measurements. There's no actual conflict at this stage. Right. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. And thanks for the great talk. Thank you. Thank you, Sumi. Um, are there any other questions? There's a comment from Anna Watts to Ingo um, about, sorry, figure five of Riley et al. But I think Ingo has seen that. So um, thank you very much. So I think with that, we will thank Cole again for the great talk and we'll move on to our next speaker who is um, Hurt Rymakers from the University of Amsterdam. Okay, give me one sec. Can you see my slides now? Yes, and I see Hurt is in my office. <laughs> Very nice. Okay, good. Um, so um, I'd like to welcome her Rhymakers, um, who will be talking to us today about the equation of state constraints from NICE's mass radius estimate of PSRJ 0740 plus 6220 and multi-messenger observations. So please take it away. Hurt. Yeah. Um, so first of all, let me thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak um, at this workshop. So my name is Gerrit Rijmakers. I'm a, I'm a PhD student at the University of Amsterdam. Um, and today I'll be talk talking about um, equation of state constraints from the recent mass radius estimate by NICER of uh, JO740, um, and also including multi-messenger observations. So I'm really gonna focus on, um, on the paper that has just come out, um, but really this is the sort of the cumulative work of the last few years um, that I did as part of the NICER XPSI team. Um, and these are some of the collaborators that um, did a lot of the work as well. So I'm going to start with some bigger picture first. I know for a lot of people, this is very, um, a lot of people know this already, but I think it's good to put things in context first. So. Ultimately, we want to know more about um, how matter behaves at these extreme pressures and low temperatures. Um, this is currently not possible, however, to probe with um, experiments on Earth or do theoretical calculations of this regime. Um, so this is really where neutron stars are the ideal uh, laboratory. Um, and uh, the core of neutron stars, um, we've heard that already a few times, they can really contain all these kinds of exotic matter, or they can contain uh, just neutrons or quarks. Um, 
so we really don't know what matter does at these um, in this extreme regime so they um, they allow us to sort of probe that um, and the way that they do that so the way that we try to connect um, really what we want to know about these small scale physics and connect it to what we can observe for Newton stars um, is in the following way so how these particles interact with each other information on that will be encoded in the, in the equation of state um, and we've talked a little bit about this yesterday already that this step might actually not be so trivial once you know the equation of state there's still a lot of freedom um, in modeling your equation of state or modeling your physics um, so i think that's something we should start to think about as well um, but for now we're focusing a lot on the equation of state um, and by picking a point on this uh, relationship we can map that by solving some differential equations to a mass radius point and i haven't plotted it here yet but um, this could also be a tidal deformability um, but this is just mass and radius um, and these are things that we can observe with for example nicer which is shown here um, or gravitational wave uh, detectors um, which we've heard a lot about yesterday already so this is basically the root of how we go from observing Newton stars to actually tell us something about the physics. Um, and I'll, I'll really briefly mention this first part in the context of NICER. So Cole just gave a really nice overview of, um, of what they did in their group. Um, and I just wanted to highlight the results that um, we got uh, within the XPSI team. So first, XPSI is the, the, the software that um, Tom Riley has uh, developed here in Amsterdam. Um, so it stands for X-ray pulse simulation and inference. Um, if anybody wants to have a go at it, it's open source. So you can uh, do all of this yourself as well. Um, and what they um, found in the, in the recent paper, Riley et al. 2021, um, is basically summarized in this plot here. So we're showing a posterior distribution on the mass and the radius of this uh, new pulsar J0740. Um, and the most interesting to look at is this radius uh, part here, where you see in the dashed lines, uh, the prior distribution. Um, then in blue, we show the posterior distribution for the radius uh, when we only consider the data from NICER. Um, and in gray, it's a little bit fainter, but you can see the constraints that come from uh, the XMMN, XMM data set. Um, and then in red, we show the posterior distribution when you combine the two. Um, and what we find is that the radius is um, roughly 12.4 kilometers, uh, plus or minus one kilometer. The mass is uh, very well constrained, but again, we um, this is pretty much uh, all due to the radio measurement of this, this pulsar. Um, I do want to briefly mention that uh, this result, this 12.4 kilometer, um, is different than uh, what Cole just presented. Um, there's a large number of reasons why that is. There's different sampler settings, different priors. Um, and I think there's a really nice summary, actually, in both papers on this, on this um, on these differences. So if you, if you want to know more in, uh, in detail, I would uh, recommend looking there. So what I mainly will be talking about is, um, is this part. When we have the mass radius estimate, um, how do we translate that into, um, into constraints on the equation of state? So first of all, I'll briefly mention the uh, methodology that we use. Um, as I think everyone basically now we're using a, a Bayesian approach um, where we want to learn some sort of posterior distribution on the equation of state. And using Bayes theorem, we can say, OK, we have a prior on the equation of state, multiply it by, um, by the likelihood. And in this case, the likelihood is then given by, um, in this case, for uh, a J0740, the mass radius uh, estimate that NICER provided. Um, this likelihood can also be, for example, for radio timing, it can be a function of just the mass or for gravitational wave events, it's um, two component masses and, and their um, 
corresponding tidal deformabilities. Now, in order to do this, um, we have to sample a lot of points from this posterior distribution, but it's uh, it's not feasible to compute a um, compute an, an equation of state from first uh, every time. Uh, so what we do instead is we we parameterize the equation of state. Um, so let me mention that. Um, we take a parameterization of the equation of state, but there are different approaches that people um, uh, people take. So, for example, you can also uh, do discrete sampling of a pre-computed uh, pre set of equations of state, and we saw this yesterday already, I think, in Sumi's talk. Um, um, and we also saw another method um, where you can do non-parametric um, equation of state inference, where you use Gaussian processes to um, to put constraints on the on the equation of state. So we're not doing any of that. We're doing uh, equation of state parameterizations. Um, and to get a feel of um, a little bit of what the systematic uncertainties are introduced by fixing your parameterization, we use two different um, models. So one is a very uh, widely used equation of state model that is the piecewise polytropic one, um, where we basically cut the space of um, the density pressure space into different pieces where each piece is um, approximated by a polytrope defined by its polytropic index. Um, this was already introduced a while back um, by Jocelyn. Um, and we're using the specific parameterization from, uh, from Habler et al. Um, where at lower densities, we continuously match, match to um, calculations of neutron star matter um, yeah, at these lower densities. And then at, at really low densities uh, below 0 0.5 uh, saturation density, we connect to a crust equation of state. So one of the main drawbacks of the, the polytropic model is that um, this gives you large discontinuities in the speed of sound, which may or may not be um, physical. So the other parameterization that we um, that we investigate is um, defined in the speed of sound space, um, where we have a little bit more um, theoretical limits as well um, to constrain this. So um, we see a plot here of the um, speed of sound as a function, or um, in terms of the speed of light as a function of the energy density. Um, and predicted by calculations in the um, high density limit, uh, the speed of sound has to converge to this value of one over third um, times the speed of light. So that's built into this model. And then at lower densities, um, we put some additional constraints from Fermi nuclear theory um, that basically just put a upper limit on the speed of sound at these densities. Um, okay, so with, with these parameterizations in hand and, and the methodology, we can look at what, this, what the constraints uh, are given um, different types of data sets. So I'll be talking about these uh, three um, measurements basically to constrain the equation state. So um, radio timing gives us uh, pulsar masses, um, which we, we already saw in Thankful's uh, talk. Um, gravitational wave signals give you some information on the tidal deformability of the binary neutron star components, um, which we also heard a lot about yesterday already. And then I think the most important for, for this talk is uh, the recent measurement of J0740, the mass and radius measurement. Uh, from X-ray pulse profile modeling, and also the previous one, uh, J0030. So I'm going to go through these uh, step by step to sort of separate out their contributions to the constraints of the equation of state, um, starting from radio timing. So let me um, explain this plot in a little bit of detail because I'm going to show a few of them. Um, so this is mass on the y-axis, radius on the x-axis, and in the black dashed lines, we show the 90% credible region of our prior distribution, um, left for the piecewise polytropic model, right for our speed of sound model. 
Um, then in green and orange, we basically show uh, the constraints on the equation of state coming from the measurement of this highest known uh, pulsar. So this just the radio timing of GO740 uh, presented in Fonseca et al. Um, and you can see that this already cuts down your prior um, prior distribution by a lot. So it's excluding a lot of um, possibilities already. Um, just to stress, as thankful already mentioned, the importance of um, radio timing measurements. So then I'll move to gravitational wave uh, constraints. So we've looked at two different events. We've looked at um, GW178.17, um, and we've looked at 1904.25. So I think most people are familiar with 1708.17, uh, the first binary Newton star event. Um, and then the second one was 1904.25, um, which had uh, a much more massive neutron star um, as a primary component. Um, so what that means for the, or the constraints coming from these events on the equation of state, um, I've shown here. So again, black dash line is our prior distribution. Uh, GW178.17 is here in the orange. Um, and 1904.25 is, uh, is in the blue. So we can see that 1708.17 really, um, really shows more support for a little bit lower radii, so softer equations of state. Um, and then looking at 1904.25, you might think, okay, we got a lot of information from this event, but I do want to note that um, the tidal deformability measurement of this event was actually not informative um, at all. So what we really see here is the effect that the primary, the high mass of the primary component has on the equation of state. But um, once you include um, basically masses from radio timing, um, you wouldn't gain any, uh, any more information from 1904.25. Um, and then the, in, in green, we show the combined constraints um, just from the gravitational wave event. So we got, as you can see, quite um, broad posterior distributions, um, slightly favoring lower radii. So then I'll move to um, the constraints on the equation of state coming from uh, NICER itself. So first, um, I mean, again, same plot uh, in green, sorry, in the orange line, um, I'm showing the constraints coming from uh, the recent mass radius estimate of J0740. Um, and then in blue, I show the constraints coming from the previous uh, nicer pulsar, which was J0030. Um, J0030, as was already mentioned, the mass wasn't known. So the posterior distribution, both in radius and in mass, is quite broad um, for that one. Um, so when you combine the two measurements, you see that really, so that's the green posterior. Um, when you combine the measurement, you see that really most of the information comes from, um, from the recent J0740 measurement. Um, so then finally, let me uh, show the combined constraints. So what I'm showing here is, um, again, the same posterior distributions um, in orange. I'm basically showing all the constraints on the equation of state that were known previous, previously. So before um, the radius of J0740 was, was measured. Um, and then in green, you see the distribution once we add this measurement. Um, so what we can see from this is um, there's definitely some, uh, there's definitely got some constraints coming from this specific radius measurement of, um, of J0740 more than just having the mass uh, known from radio timing. Um, and this is especially, um, this is more pronounced in our speed of sound model just because it um, by definition sort of favors a little bit softer equation of state. And just because the, the, the radius measurement of um, J0740 
was was clearly favoring more um it was clearly showing more support for larger radii so that's where um you start for the speed of sound model you start sort of start to push against the the prior boundary um i want to mention then that uh basically this this prior boundary um seems quite uh seems quite important and a lot of it comes from are uh, low density calculations um, within the framework of uh, chiral effective field theory. So we did a, um, a, a check using different approaches to calculating um, the equation of state of, of neutron star matter at these low densities um, from different papers over the years. So in this plot, I'm showing uh, pressure versus um, uh, density is killed by saturation density. Um, and you can see these four different approaches to estimating uncertainty in the equation of state at low density, um, which is, when I say low density, I mean um, basically the first point of the calculations after 0.5 saturation density up till 1.1 1 .1, uh, saturation density, where we connect to our high density parameterizations. Um, now you see, uh, you see some, some uh, differences in these in these uh, in these approaches, and and we again we parameterize this by uh, saying um, uh, a single polytrope um, is well enough to sort of fit the behavior within uh, within this uh, within these uncertainty bounds. So um, what we then see for our inferred posterior distribution. So what I'm showing here are um, constraints on the equation of state just coming from JO740's mass radius estimate. So it's not including any of the uh, GW or radio timing. Um, so I think the most important thing that we, that we notice is that there are some discrepancies between, um, between the four different uh, low density calculations of the order of 0.5 kilometers. Um, but still much smaller, than, I think, than the um, statistical uncertainty that we have in these distributions. We see, uh, we do see a big difference with um, inferring the equation of state when we we don't use these low density calculations. So that's shown here in the in the uh, in the red curve. Um, what we see there is that basically, if we just parameterize um, if we put our high density parameterization um, on top of our crust equation of state, then uh, of course JO740 will uh, give you much more support also for larger radii, um, which is less pronounced in the speed of sound model because um, there's also these different constraints coming from QCD uh, calculations and Fermi liquid theory. Um, but I think it's interesting interesting to sort of see the effect that these low density calculations uh, um, uh, from chiral effective field theory have uh, on, on our inferred distributions. So I'll mention the, um, the speed of sound in Newton stars as well. So this was briefly mentioned as well by Jocelyn yesterday um, uh, from this paper, Legret et al. Uh, 2021. Um, so Again, I plot the speed of sound as a, um, in terms of the speed of light as a function of the energy density. Um, and then this is the posterior distribution from all uh, from the combined constraints, including uh, gravitational waves and radio uh, timing in both nicer pulsars. Um, and what we see is that this um, conformal limit of, of uh, one third that's predicted at high densities by, by QCD um, most likely has to be um, at some point in the in the Newton star, the speed of sound has to go over this limit um, before coming down again to um, to reach this limit in, in asymptotic densities. Um, and this is also, I mean, this was previously already shown in papers by um, uh, Steiner and Badak, for example, that. Uh, just with the radio timing of massive pulsars, you would um, 
you would need this, but um, we just wanted to show this again with, with the combined constraints of, of all these observables. And then finally, um, I briefly wanted to mention the uh, the maximum mass of neutron stars. So we, uh, we've heard a little bit about this uh, yesterday as well. Um, this is an important quantity, uh, um, for example, for binary neutron star mergers, where you want to know if the remnant of the merger um, has prompt collapse to a black hole, might be a stable neutron star, anything in between. Um, so what we see here is um, a histogram of our posterior distribution of the maximum mass of neutron stars. Um, purple is the, the mass measurement of uh, J0740 by Fonseca et al. Um, and then I think the most um, interesting is, is the green posterior distribution, which shows the distribution of the combined constraints, um, which basically gives you some Thing around 2.2 solar masses um, for the piecewise polytropic model, a little bit lower for the speed of sound model. Um, and that's something I, I, I'd like to note is that um, although the lower limit of our distribution is very consistent with what J0740 gives us, um, the upper limit is largely due to our choice of parameterization. So you still have some freedom there. Um, and I also want to note that this doesn't include any arguments about the remnant of 17 or 817. So from, from EM observations of 17 or 817, you can make arguments about uh, whether it collapsed immediately to a black hole or not. And that puts uh, also constraints on, on, this, uh, on this observable. So in conclusion, um, I think the, the recent mass radius estimate of, of J0740, um, it really is an interesting, uh, it's really interesting that it, it, it sort of still supports these more stiffer equations of state, whereas I think from, from GW, we, we might have thought that um, maybe you could have some softer equation state as well, but nicer, both nicer measurements actually um, are, are really towards these lower, tend towards these, sorry, higher radii. Um, and I think it's really interesting to see how that sort of plays out. At the moment, the uncertainties are still quite large. So um, uh, there is, as Cole already mentioned, there is no discrepancy between, between any of the measurements. Um, but it, it will be really interesting to see uh, what future missions, for example, like EXTP, Strobex, um, or even just more nicer sources will give us. So this is a sort of cartoonish. Um, simulation that I did uh, a few years ago where we have, let's say, five, 15 pulsars with pretty accurate mass radius measurements. And you can really see that you start to decrease the uncertainty in our equation of state. Um, but then we also have these very exciting other ways of, of measuring the equation of state. So I really think uh, it's going to be really interesting to see um, this whole multi-messenger equation of state field in the, in the next few years. And I'll, I'll take any questions uh, now. Thank you so much, Herc, for that great talk. Um, so I'll open the floor to um, any questions. So please raise your hand either in the um, using the Zoom function or in the chat. Um, Madhapa Prakash has, Prakash has a question. Please go ahead, Madhapa. Yeah. Uh, well, just for clearing up the matters, my, I go by Prakash. OK. Now I have a comment on uh, PQCD limits. Those who do perturbative QCD calculations for their livelihood have <clears throat> reached the conclusion that the PQCD limits are applicable only at very high densities to give a number about 40 times nuclear density. Such densities are not realizable within neutron stars of the masses we are talking about. So, and much is made out of this PQCD limit, and I think it is somewhat of a red herring. And uh, so I just wanted to alert people that uh, unless a precocious uh, attainment of asymptotic freedom occurs at uh, the kinds of densities that neutron stars can uh, attain, PQCD limits are really a red herring. That's my comment. <clears throat> 
yeah i think that's a really good uh point that you make is that um nowhere in in our um inference do we expect this limit to be reached within the in, within the neutron star um so really the the constraints on the speed of sound model um which sort of cut down at, at slightly lower radii um come from our speed of sound constraint at lower densities which sort of um yeah it doesn't allow you to 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 uh, reach those high radii again but yeah thank you any other further questions for hurt um ben margalit um ben would you like ben would you like to ask your question or else i can read it out loud sure yeah thanks great talk i was just wondering if you could go back to the point on uh 1904-25 and I was just curious how that really, it seemed like it had an impact on the lower limit on the radius. And I was curious how that impact came about and if you were using the broad prior and spins, um, which allowed for high mass neutron stars. Yeah, so I think um, really what you see here is that the lower limit um, from, from these gravitational is because we don't impose any cutoff um, at like to a solar mass or something that every equation state has to reach um, that value. So just because the the posterior distribution of 1904-25 does include some um, yeah high mass solutions, um, I think you will gain some information uh, on the equation state. Um, but yeah, that's the point I, I wanted to make. It's definitely not because we've measured the tidal deformability to any precision that we can say. Um, uh, I see, great, okay, that's helpful. So these priors basically aren't showing any additional information about known pulsar masses. So no, not... no. Okay, no. thanks. Thank you, Ben, thank you, Hurt. Um, any other further questions? Quickly scrolling down. Otherwise, um, let's thank Hurt for his great talk and um, move on to our final talk of today, which is by Natalie Webb. Thank you, Hurt. So Natalie, I am looking. Oh, great. Hello. Hi. Um, Can you hear me OK? Or do you want me to put my headphone on? Oh, no, you. I can hear you well. I mean, whatever you prefer. OK. And I think you have permission to share your screen. Yeah, I'm just going to start now. Great. So um, it's a so, great. Um, it's a great. Oh, oh. yes, there is a. Yes, there is a. That's okay. That's I okay. Because I. I can put the. I can put the headset on if you prefer. It might make it a bit easier. Okay. How is that? Is that any better? Yes. I think, yeah, there's no echo with me anymore. Um, but thank you, Natalie. So um, it's a great pleasure to um, welcome Natalie Webb, who uh, will be, who's um, speaking from I hope to lose, I'm correct, and um, will be talking to us today and our final talk on finding new X-ray bright neutron stars with which to constrain the equation of state. So really um, ending off, I think, this session very nicely. Thank you, Natalie. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you very much. Yeah, so um, I'm going to carry on a little bit from where um, everyone else has left off, um, talking about the fantastic results that NICE has uh, provided us uh, with over the last few years. Uh, but as you've seen, there's only been a very small handful of neutron stars that are actually particularly well adapted to doing this kind of work. And it'd be ideal if we could find more neutron stars um, that we could we could observe with NICER, but probably possibly other uh, kinds of missions. And that's what my talk's going to be about uh, now. So hopefully you've seen the slide change there. Sometimes I have trouble with the sticking. Is it okay? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, so the, uh, the observatory I'm gonna talk about is another X-ray observatory, um, which is called uh, XMM Newton. Sorry, Natalie, um, mm -hmm. I can't see the next slide. I think you have to go into view. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, you don't see a picture of XMM? No. Okay. I see your title slide. Okay, let me try one more time.
Do you see it now? Yeah, perfect now. Now it's okay. working. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, so yeah, this is the observatory I'm going to talk about. Um, and the advantage of Exmo Newton is it's a focusing telescope. Um, it's also extremely uh, sensitive and it's got a very large field of view. This means that in a general observation, we detect um, around 100 uh, extra sources in the field of view that which we can focus and actually be able to detect them, which is contrary to, to NISA, where we only um, pick up the counts from the whole of the field of view. So this means that we can find many, many uh, new serendipitously detected sources and, and that's uh, the subject of this talk now. So uh, on this slide, you can see a uh, hammer eight of projection of all of the pointings that have been made with the Exmo Newton Observatory since it was launched back in uh, December 1999. So it's been in, um, in orbit for 21 years now. And what we do um, as uh, uh, every single year is produce a new version of the Exmo Newton catalog. And that's to say we provide all of the serendipitously detected sources with uh, Exmo Newton in a catalogue format with a large amount of, uh, of information. So the latest version of this catalogue uh, for which I'm responsible is the 4XMM DR10, so this is the data release 10, and this is uh, including data all the way up until December 2019, and the catalogue was released in December 2020. And in the catalogue we've got almost 850,000 uh, X-ray detections where these relate to actually about 575,000 unique sources. And that's simply because a lot of the sources have actually been um, detected many times. So we've pointed the same field several times, and in fact, up to 74 times for some of these sources. We provide a huge amount of information for each one of these detections. Um, and we also provide, for instance, spectra and light curve for uh, the brighter sources. So about uh, 303,000 of the, of the sources in the catalog. Um, and we also make a cross correlation with 222 uh, other catalogues of all different wavelengths and also uh, multi messenger catalogues. And we cover about uh, 1,200 square degrees of the sky. So um, this is just a summary of some of the things we provide within this catalog. Uh, obviously, we provide an identifier of the, of the source, uh, coordinates observation date, time, observing mode, information about the exposure, about the extent of the source. And then what's quite interesting is we provide counts, fluxes and rates um, in different bands. So the different kind of bands that we provide, um, you can see in the bottom right, uh, there's the five uh, bands that uh, correspond to the lowest energies in um, the XMM domain to the highest energies. And we also provide information on the full band and then a small restricted band. There's some information also provided on the, what we call the soft band, which is the first three bands added together, and then further information on the, on the hardest band, so the bands four and five added together. We also provide uh, hardness ratios. So the definition of a hardness ratio is on the bottom left of this slide. And you can see um, that it's quite simply um, one band minus uh, the, the the inferior band divided by the sum of these two bands. And this gives us some information about the spectrum um, uh, of, the, of the source we're interested in. We obviously provide a lot of information about um, the reliability of the source, the quality, um, and some variability information. Um, so just to give you some context, um, you can see some of the uh, different uh, X-ray missions that have been launched. Um, and then you can see the number of sources um, in the X-ray catalogues uh, for these different uh, uh, missions um, plotted on the Y-axis. And you can see that the, uh, the X-Men catalogue is by far the largest currently, although the e catalogue will be much bigger than this once it's released. So as I said, um, what we'd really like to be able to do is find some more of these thermally emitting millisecond pulsars um, that will be uh, excellent targets for NICER, but also for other missions um, in the future, uh, which we can then uh, model the X-ray light curve to constrain the, the mass and the radius and therefore the neutral star equation of state. It's only about a dozen or so uh, of these millisecond pulsars that are particularly um, observable with NICER. So we decided to search within the, X, uh, the 4XMM catalog to try and find some more of them. So this is actually work that's in progress. I had hoped that um, we'd have a little bit more information to give you by this uh, by this meeting. Um, but so this is, uh, unfortunately, there's, I don't have um, some excellent targets, but um, it's looking very promising. So the first thing we did was take um, the ATNF uh, radio pulsar catalog. 
and cross-correlated it with our eczema mutant catalogue and we found that 47 of those uh, ATNF uh, millisecond pulsars are present in the eczema mutant catalogue. So this is actually 24 more than were published um, in the previous uh, work that was similar um, by Leah Tao in 2018. We've actually now reanalyzed all of those 47 millisecond pulsars and just so um, uh, so it's clear that we count a millisecond pulsar as a pulsar with uh, an, a period of less than 30 milliseconds. Looking at the X-ray spectra of all of these uh, pulsars, we find that actually 32 of them could be considered to be thermal emitters, which is extremely interesting. Um, it's a large uh, sample um, that could be eventually interesting to uh, observe if we can detect the uh, X-ray uh, pulsations. So four of these have got uh, very good NISA mass radius uh, constraints, and six others have also had observations with, uh, with NISA. So in the full frame mode, uh, with eczema mutant where we can detect a large number of sources, uh, we can't actually uh, do any uh, timing analysis of millisecond pulsars because the time resolution is insufficient. So dedicated follow-up observations are required in the PN timing mode um, to be able to do this. Seven of these objects actually have PN timing um, mode data, but uh, following a pulsation search, we've not managed to find any pulsations in these, in these sources. We have found, though, found a couple of very fairly bright uh, millisecond pulsars, which would be they need to be fairly bright to be able to be detected uh, by NISA, um, that we're working on at the moment, and they could become uh, good NISA targets. The other ones that we're looking at, at uh, will be too faint, unfortunately, for NISA, but in the future, they could be um, good for the Athena X-ray Observatory, which will be launched in 2033. So those are the known pulsars, but uh, there's a lot of serendipitous science that can be done with, uh, with the XMA mutant catalog, given its uh, large size. So we know the space density of neutron stars. Um, there's many different estimates of the space density of neutron stars. This is just uh, taken one of those. Um, some You may have your favorite uh, space density of neutron stars. Um, but this is just to get a rough um, estimate of the number of systems we could possibly have in the catalog. Um, and we know uh, roughly how many of the pulsars we know today uh, are millisecond pulsars. And so by taking that and the reach that we have got with XMM mutant and the amount of sky that's been observed, we could expect maybe as many as, a, as 100,000 millisecond pulsars um, in the catalog. And I'm not sure it would be this high, but I mean, it is possible. So um, the idea was to try and look for some of these systems um, using uh, the characteristics from our sample of 47 that I've just presented to you. So what we've done here is um, plotted uh, different, uh, different hardness ratios. Um, first of all, what you can see in this graduated scale on the, on the right hand side, this is just the, the number of, uh, of systems from the, uh, the catalog. And over plotted on there, you can see the different uh, pulsars from our sample of 47. You can see those pulsars that have got thermal spectra, you can see those pulsars um, with non-thermal spectra, and you can see um, those that are in globular clusters. So thermal in red, non-thermal in blue, and globular clusters um, are in black points. You'll see that there's more than 47 points on there, but that's because se several of these objects have been observed more than a single time. So we've pl plotted different, um, different quantities against different quantities. So the different hardness ratios that I uh, presented to you earlier. This is six of the 10 different plots that we've studied. And you can see that, um, that you can delimit areas where the thermal uh, pulsars are sitting in these plots and the non-thermal pulsars. Um, and mixed in there, you can see also the globular cluster uh, pulsars. So if you delimit areas where um, the uh, thermal pulsars are, we can then take these, uh, these uh, spectral characteristics um, from the 10 different plots we've studied, and then try and use those to search for similar objects in the rest of the catalog. And doing that, we turn out 7,340 um, uh, uh, objects, which could potentially be uh, neutron star candidates. Uh, we validate that by the fact that this sample does contain 17 of the thermal millisecond pulsars from our uh, sample, and it also has one non-thermal, but you can see there was always one non-thermal uh, pulsar that always sit, seems to sit in the thermal um, range, um, which we've not yet uh, properly, properly understood. 
there are a large number of these without a Gaia counterpart, which you'd expect if they are going to be uh, uh, just isolated neutron stars, for instance, um, as uh, they would just be too they just be too faint to be detected in the optical. However, what is interesting is many of these are bright enough that can be detected with NICE up. So we're currently following these up, um, trying to identify whether or not they really are uh, neutron star systems, and obviously to determine whether we're going to be able to find uh, pulsations. Um, but I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to find some very interesting candidates to either be followed up with NICER or uh, uh, if not with other X-ray uh, missions in the future. If you look at this plot, a plot on the bottom um, right hand side of the slide, though, um, you can see that there's um, the, the majority of the thermal pulsars to the left, which is normal. These are the soft, softest uh, 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 spectral uh, objects. And then um, as we move along the distribution, you can see they become the hard uh, non-thermal pulsars. In fact, from our spectral analysis, there seems to be a smooth transition between um, the thermal to the non-thermal uh, pulsars, uh, which uh, might might mean that this is possibly linked to um, the viewing angle where a pulsar presents itself as uh, more thermal because you're looking uh, um, directly at the, uh, the, the soft uh, polar cap. Um, that, that's uh, something that's still under, under study. So what else can we do? Um, it's been proposed that globular clusters contain uh, not only many, many uh, second pulsars, but also uh, many thermally emitting uh, millisecond pulsars. So therefore, it'd be interesting to take log observations of globular clusters. And if you know the ephemerides, you can then uh, fold the, the, the data to, uh, to extract the light curves of the different pulsars. However, again, looking at the same plot, uh, it seems that the majority of the globular cluster uh, millisecond pulsars actually um, appear in the same region as the non-thermal pulsars. So this may not actually be the best avenue to search in. But this is only one area we can, um, we can study to try and constrain the neutron star equation of state using X-ray data. Um, there are many different things that can be done, um, for instance, using either type 1 x-ray bursts or using the photospheric radius expansions uh, during the magnetar bursts, for instance, which would give us a constraint on the radius of our, of our neutron star and therefore give us a constraint on the equation of state. We can also observe how uh, a neutron star cools after an outburst, and this also gives us an in, uh, insight into the equation of state of the, of the dense matter. Or we can do spectral fitting of the thermal emission from the surface of old neutron stars, such as those that you find in, uh, in a globular cluster. And this, is, it's, this has proved to be extremely um, uh, a good way of trying to make some constraint on the equation of state, especially if you take a population of these thermally uh, emitting uh, old neutron stars, um, as has been done by several different groups. And this is just a couple of uh, references uh, referring to some of this work that's been done. So um, a couple of years back, we took um, seven different of the uh, globular cluster neutron star uh, low mass X-ray binaries. Um, we modeled the thermal emission um, that was observed uh, using um, both the XMEM Newton uh, observatory uh, data and also Chandra data. So this, these spectra that we modeled with the NS Atmos uh, uh, model that's available in XSpec. Um, but we also used an empirically uh, parameterized uh, equation of state um, and used a MCMC uh, to, to, to fit the spectra um, in, in parallel with the, the, the fitting to constrain the mass and the radius with our NS Atmos. So this uh, empirical parameterization is based on a Taylor expansion, um, baryon density, uh, approximately the nuclear saturation density. Um, so you can see how that um, uh, looks here in the in these equations that are given, and the parameters that we try to constrain were um, QSAT, LSIM, and KSIM. And what you can see in this plot on the left hand side are our constraints on these three parameters: LSIM, KSIM, and QSAT. Um, and we were able to make some uh, interesting constraints on these uh, on these nuclear par uh, parameters. We also managed to make some constraints on the, the mass and the radius, as you can see in the plot on the bottom right. Um, so this is a typical mass radius plot. Um, you can see the, the contours uh, 
giving you the 50%, 90% and 99% uh, uh, confidence regions. And if you take a mass of about 1.45 solar masses, which is the, uh, the average mass that we have for our uh, neutron stars, we get about a 3% error on the radius. We're currently making improvements to what we've done um, in this paper. Um, we're uh, making improvements to the equation of state um, by adding phase transitions, um, and hopefully we'll be able to make some more interesting constraints in the future. So um, just to conclude, I've shown you that we've uh, managed to uh, detect uh, 47 different uh, millisecond pulsars in the uh, Exum and Newton data, and 32 of these seem to be good uh, thermal emitters, which uh, may be eventually interesting for modeling the uh, X-ray uh, light curve. Two of them look like they may be very good candidates for NISA. Um, I'm not going to reveal which two yet because we're still working on this, and uh, hopefully I'll have some good news for you soon. There's a possibility that smooth transition from thermal to non-thermal spectra could just be simply due to the, our viewing angle of these systems. And there are thousands of potential new neutron star candidates in the catalog. Obviously, this is going to need quite a large amount of follow-up work to be able to identify whether or not they are going to be useful for the constraints on neutron star equation of state. Whether they're going to be good for NISA is one thing. Uh, others will be able to be followed up with other X-ray telescopes, such as Athena. Um, it, it's not clear whether following up the globular cluster millisecond pulsars will be able to provide good uh, uh, constraints using the, the modeling of the X-ray light curves. But as I mentioned, there are many other constraints that can be made from other types of X-ray observations. And combining both the spectral fitting and realistic equations of state constrains both the nuclear parameters as well as the equation of state. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Natalie, for the great talk. Um, so I'll open the floor to any questions. Um, are there any questions? Please raise your hands. I'm looking, there is quite a lot of chat, but I think that is about the speed of sound. So one question I have is that you have now such a large sample of candidates, etc. And of course, you focus the talk on those that are possible nicer targets and equation of interesting for equation of state. But um, there must be quite a lot coming out in terms of understanding formation scenarios for all these different um, millisecond pulses. I wondered if you could comment on that from the from kind of another perspective, I guess, from the astrophysics. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, this is one thing we're going to look into as well, but we don't actually have any results on that either. Um, this, we've just, with this is work that's just in progress at the moment um, uh, with a student of mine. And yeah, I mean, this is an interesting sample to be able to study a lot further, not only obviously for the equation of state, but for, yeah, the evolution of these systems as well. Yeah, I, I wasn't aware that there were just so many interesting new candidates coming out and it's just really impressive. So thank you for um, sharing that. Um, any questions for Natalie? Otherwise... We do have some scheduled um, discussion time. So what I propose is um, I haven't actually, we haven't actually planned anything specific, but I do think that there are quite a lot of interesting questions that people have come up um, with in the chat I've seen, as well as further questions for all the speakers. Maybe all the speakers in the session, if they're still here, can turn their cameras on. Um, maybe. Oh, I have, yes. I'm on mute, Natalie as well, great. Because we do have um, a discussion session on Thursday, which will be a panel um, session. But I do wonder, are there any, thankfully is going to join us in a second. I do wonder if there are any questions, um, especially early career scientists may have that you would like to ask and pose now for our speakers, please feel free to, or else to follow up on some of the points. Um, maybe I can pick on Ingo as he, I see him kind of there, not um, to discuss, maybe resume what's being discussed in the chat as well. Any questions for each other? Please go ahead, speakers. Well, 
I actually, if you don't mind, I have a question related to gravitational waves. And, and that is given that the tidal deformability constraints depend very strongly on the high frequency component because the contribution of tidal deformation to the waveform strongly increases with increasing frequency. Is there a concern about systematic effects that might exist that would render those constraints uh, uh, somewhat questionable or are, are there things that need to be improved to be confident about that? Because if you only go up to a smaller frequency, then you're not gonna do as well in terms of the constraints. So are people very confident they can go all the way to merger with numerical and analytic models for tidal deformability? Um, I see Jocelyn has turned her camera on. So Jocelyn, I'll pass the floor to you. So um, the, the first thing I might say is that Sebastiano's talk uh, yesterday was, was a nice overview of this. And there's in particular a paper led by Rosella Gamba uh, that talks about the systematics um, for the high frequency cutoff specifically. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so I, I think uh, uh, those are are definitely. Let me let me think how to phrase this. For seventeen oh eight seventeen, I think we're pretty confident that the systematic uncertainty from waveform modeling is substatistical. Mm -hmm. Not negligible completely, you know, it's maybe a third or roughly, depending on how you estimate these things. Certainly, if we get um, higher frequency sensitivity with detector improvements that are already in place, that will be something they'll want to consider more carefully. Okay, thank you. Would anyone like to add to that? Um, Hurt, would you like to mention something or? No. I, I did have a question for thankful if that's allowed to change topics. Yeah. Um, could you say something about um, where radio timing is, is going to take us? Like, are we going to get much more precise measurements of mass? Are we going to get a large population sample of, of pulsars? Like, how does the future look like uh, for you? Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting question, and I'll I think I can answer that at least in a vague way. Um, so I would say that, as I mentioned, I mean the ability to make precise mesh, uh, mass measurements using Shapiro delay uh, that's sort of a rare opportunity to have. Um, but we are trying to observe as many of those systems as we can, as often as we can, and and conduct more of these. Uh, targeted campaigns. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't know about, you know, numbers. I don't know how many more kind of 0740s and 1231s there are going to be. Um, I, I think it's quite a few. I mean, you know, there are 14 binaries in the nanograph data set, for example, uh, where we're able to constrain the mass of, of the pulsar by using Shapiro delay. Um, so that's, that's quite a few. I mean, that, that's certainly a handful. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's a little bit difficult to get uh, observing time for those observations because it is quite annoying to request such specific observation windows. Um, but I mean, we're certainly continuing to do this work. And I think that honestly, like those 740 results, for example, are a really good justification for doing more of that work, right? So I think that going forward, um, we, we're going to be able to point to something really clear and, you know, this was really productive work and we were able, uh, you know, by doing X, Y, and Z observations, we were able to make this constraint. Um, uh, so I, I think things are looking good. We're just a little bit, um, you know, it's, it's unlucky that there are so few highly inclined systems. I wish there were more of them and I wish that we could time them precisely. So, you know, it's a little bit up to luck, but we're certainly continuing to do that. Uh, and, and I think that there are going to be more opportunities for these kinds of studies. So. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Thankful. Um, and there's a question from Prakash, Prakash in the chat um, asking, 
Oh, yes, sorry, I need to scroll up. Asking about, and so this is really to Slavko and Natalie, and I see Anna Watts is also online. Um, if any of you can expand on EXTP and Strobex, and Jocelyn is also asking the same question. I think Anna can speak to EXTP and and Strobex, or I can talk about Strobex too, so either way. Sure, so EXTP is the Enhanced X-ray Timing and Polarimetry Experiment. Um, it's a Chinese-led, joint Chinese-European mission concept. Um, it's currently in phase B in China, funded through to phase C. Um, and there's a lot of activity going on in Europe at the moment, basically with the European Space Agency discussing mission opportunity proposals, uh, basically in the involvement of all of the national space agencies. Um, so that's piling ahead uh, a little bit delayed because of the pandemic, um, but basically from the European side, um, because we can't get people together in a room to discuss things, um, but that's progressing very nicely. Um, EXTP would have, um, so again, we're talking here about several square meter hard X-ray uh, detectors to let us broaden out to the accreting neutron stars for pulse profile modeling. Um, also with a soft X-ray capability and for EXTP, a polarimeter, which potentially helps us to get geometry constraints as well. Um, so again, building on XPay, and it will be a bit larger than, than XPay. Um, then Strobex is a NASA Pro class concept. So I guess we're all waiting to see, and perhaps someone from the US side of Slavco can update more on where things are with the Astrophysics Decadal Survey. We're, we're still waiting. Yeah. Okay, right. Um, I, so think I think it's, it, it, the reports went to peer review. So I think in a couple of months. Uh, okay, so that the we would aim for a launch date kind of 2027, I think, if it were to go ahead. Um, Strobex is also a multi-square meter, soft X-ray, kind of mega nicer, plus hard X-ray detector, um, but minus the polarimetry cap capability. Um, but again, aiming to do pulse profile modeling for the faint rotation powered pulsars, um, and also opening up for the accreting neutron stars as well. So two good concepts on the table. Um, we'd just like to have one very firmly in a launch slot, I think, more than anything else. A lot of the prep work's been done, basically, by a lot of the people who are giving talks today. Um, so yeah, it'd be nice to see one of them firmly on launch pad at some point, but not yet, not quite yet. Thank you, Anna. And Slavko, would you like to add to that or? Um, no, I think it's, you know, it's one of those, it's kind of like, it's a waiting game. Uh, I think the one positive is now there's, there might be a huge boost to science, basic science funding in the US. So I think that, uh, may have positive outcomes for all of us uh, if that happens. So that means it's going to previously look like, you know, these probe class missions that were proposed, including Strobex, it was probably only one was going to be selected, but hopefully, you know, more get selected. And I think Strobex is definitely a strong contender. So because it's it's kind of like, a, as Anna said, it's a super nicer combined with a super RXDE. So it's, you know, it, it really will dramatically enhance uh, kind of the science it can do because of the kind of like, there's a quantum leap in the collecting area, which is always leads to much, you know, substantial improvement in, in the data quality and then science, right? So. Thank you. I see Cole, that. we can't hear you. I think Sorry. Cole is trying to tell us something that for some reason. No, unfortunately, no, we can't hear you. Um, I would maybe if you rejoin, um, perhaps it may work. Um, I see Nanda Reyes. Okay, online. now we can. Oh, we can. Yeah, Paul, we could just. So what I what I was going to ask is for EXTP and Strobex, what is the observing plan because one of the things you emphasize Slavko is that with nicer we're willing to put two million seconds on individual targets what are the thoughts yeah. about that with respect to the xtp and strobex yeah so i think i mean it's usually like the way that nicer operates i think most observatories where there's like an initial commissioning and like science phase where kind of the team does the initial science for like the first year uh, so I imagine that would be similar, although that depends a lot of kind of the kind of how negotiations with the funding aid with the agency work, right? If like NASA says like all data have to be public right away, you can't have any uh, you know time to do your own initial science. So 
uh, I, don't, I don't know what the EXTP policy was. I think it's probably similar where you know, the team wants to collect their, do their science first and then let the rest of the world do what they want to do. So I think in, in terms of observing plant, there's some interesting puzzles now, right, with when you get to the accreting stars as well. So we know that the rotation power millisecond pulse stars, you know, those are kind of in the bag sources. We know now from NISA that we can do this. Um, so we've got a population of stars that we can go look at. We want to add the accreting ones because they're faster. They have multiple cross checks that we can do with different techniques, but they're also variable and they're transient, a lot of them. So this <laughs> that's in quite a lot of fun of, well, okay, if a source goes into outburst, do we turn and spend time on that? How long do we observe it for sensibly? So for the accreting millisecond pulses, we're talking about 100 kilosecond observations because it's relatively stable over those times. For the burst oscillation sources that, that you know, we've got to hang on there to get bursts with burst oscillations. Um, so we are thinking quite seriously about yeah, what is a sensible observing time? Do we do an initial survey, try and get some idea of which sources have good geometries? and then switch to more detailed analysis because what you don't want happening is a fight breaking out in the control room between you know a black hole transient goes off at the same time as a you know exciting neutron star source phil utley and i have to engage in mortal combat to decide who gets to observe so these are this becomes really puzzling actually as to how you plan your observing strategy out and build up enough photons because it's not as simple as with nicer where we can just hang on something and know we're going to get enough photons you know we could catch a few bursts and then discover it's not a great source geometrically so yeah, Carl, it's a good question. It's it's a complicated puzzle, I think. I think also, it's complicated. Most of the bursters are towards the galactic center, right? So then which one do you observe, right? If there are like several of them bursting at the same time. So, uh, so yeah, it yeah, is so challenging. Really lucky. They all go off at the same time and a couple of black yes. holes as well. And then it's just misery trying to decide which one we observe. Yeah, I think NICER is having problems like that. Too. There's like a magnetar and outburst, a black hole and outburst. and like a few other things in outbursts, like at the same time currently. So which one do you observe? A science point for uh, transients would be, it will probably tell us more about the composition of the star because there are indications that one or the other star could be uh, <clears throat> exhibiting uh, enhanced cooling. And uh, that is a very interesting point, at least for uh, nuclear physicists and uh, neutron star physicists. Question though is are, are these uh, uh, facilities going to be devoted to neutron stars or other uh, multi-pronged science uh, objectives? I think they're they're all kind of general purpose kind of you know all things that are hard X-rays you know so you have all kinds of you know it's probably it's going to follow up GRBs probably you know Strobex uh, because it has an all sky monitor. So it's going to try to follow up all kinds of transients. So, so nicer specific, you know, kind of most of its observing is focused on neutron stars, but it also does kind of general purpose things like there's a lot of black hole science that it does. And, you know, there's even stuff with like kind of flaring normal main sequence stars, right? So, uh, but I think Strobex will be much more general purpose. So it'll observe many, many things. I mean, you can read the uh, if you look, go to the Strobex webpage, it, it does, it's going to do black holes, accretion disks, neutron stars, galaxy clusters, um, kind of probably follow up of, on all these uh, gravitational wave sources, no doubt. So there's, so, you know, that's the point that was raised earlier, like how much that call raised is how much time do you, are you going to be able to dedicate to these objects? But with the 10 times more collecting area at least, then you you won't need like megaseconds to achieve similar uh, sensitivity to what nicer is getting. You'll you know so so you figure in one megasecond that you can accumulate over several years, you'll get you know ten times the photons that you collected with nicer over ten million seconds, right? So you know so it's 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 gonna you know. The fact that the instantaneous sensitivity is the key here, right? So, and especially for the bursting sources, because the bursts are short lived. So, you can actually accumulate a lot more photons in a shorter amount of time, which is key, right? So, thanks so much, Slavka. Unfortunately, Natalie has just left because I was going to ask if she wanted to add anything. Um, Nanda, I see Nanda Reyes online. Would you like to add anything, Nanda, as a 
Sarah, I don't want to put you on the spot, sorry. Well, we, we are preparing some of these, I mean, picking up some of these questions for the discussion session tomorrow. Uh, we're certainly, I mean, one of the things I think uh, it might be interesting to discuss is the, um, that was somehow mentioned uh, by Thankful, uh, the prospect of also in the radio, how to measure uh, the moment of inertia, for example, via the double pulsar, there was a very nice, paper uh, last year about this and um, many things in this respect that we will definitely uh, pick on tomorrow. No, Thursday, sorry. Yeah. Thank you, Nanda. Yes. Um, yeah, we can. Yeah, we will look forward to that discussion. Um, I see that um, we have Devashi Chaudhary. Devashi, are you there? You have a question for thankful or comment I saw on the chat. Uh, yes, um, I think at some point, uh, thankfully mentioned that uh, it's unlikely that you'll be finding uh, pulsars that are heavier than J740. So um, it, is there a reason to it? I'm assuming you mean in the radio, in radio observations, since we have candidates in the mass gap uh, in gravitational wave, wave observations. So uh, why is it that we, um, yeah. Yeah, so when you know when I'm talking about the the work we do in the radio, I'm I'm referring to a pretty specific source population, right? These kind of uh, canonical millisecond pulsar white dwarf binaries, and and you know there's still a lot of questions about uh, their their formation and evolution. But um, at this point, we don't, you know, I think it's certainly possible that we'll find something more massive than a 740. I don't know how likely it is. Um, it, it could take a very long time. Um, I don't think there's anything definite to say that we couldn't find something slightly more massive, uh, but it does bring up some interesting questions about, you know, formation scenarios, their neutron star, you know, double neutron star mergers that um, would result in a very massive object. Um, but, you know, when we're talking about the millisecond pulsars that we time over long time spans, we're talking about a very specific population. So um, definitely uh, radio timing is not going to help, you know, fill in the mass gap in, in the same way that kind of gravitational wave observations or something are going to be able to. Um, right. And uh, this, uh, is it also something that you derive from the, uh, uh, like yesterday, I think there was talk about uh, a bimodal distribution in the uh, in the galactic millisecond pulsar uh, mass uh, mass ranges. So is it also derived from that? Like from, uh, how this the second mode does it like trail off beyond two solar masses, sort of? Yeah. So I mean, uh, we definitely have to continue to uh, probe as wide a range of of millisecond pulsar masses as we can to see if we can can verify that bimodal distribution of masses. Um, it, you know, it has everything to do with, with the system's formation. And, and so the, I think the width of that second peak is definitely, you know, it, it's not clear where that's gonna end right now, but um, all we can do really is make more of these precise mass measurements and try to fill in uh, the mass distribution as well as we can. But I think right now, you know, we only have a handful of, of you know, greater than two solar mass neutron star measurements uh, through radio timing. So um, it's very unsure at this point, but that is something, I mean, the, the bimodal distribution that was brought up, you know, five or six years ago is something that um, we're still trying to, to uh, figure out the, the real shape of that distribution, so. I see, thank you. Just to add something to that, of course, there are also suggestions that there may be a number of black widow pulsars or redback pulsars with masses that could be 2.4 or 2.7 masses as, as the current best estimate. The, the people who work in that field, I think, are very appropriately cautious because the systematic errors, which are considerably more significant than they are in the radio time that you're doing, thankful. But it's something always to kind of keep in the back of the mind if the, the models become sufficiently better or some breakthrough exists in the observations that that might be another handle on the maximum mass of neutron stars. Thank you. Um, there's also a, a comment from Sumi Day on the chat in response to Cole's question. Sumi, would you like to um, mention it? 
Uh, so I just wanted to uh, like also add to uh, uh, what Jocelyn was also saying about the waveform systematics. So like we also had actually done the study and uh, like we saw that in case of of uh, uh, of uh, like GW seventeen or seventeen, if you use a very simple analytical model as compared to one of the most improved models that we have currently, you don't get any uh, very important uh, like changes in your current constraints. But uh, if you like go to high SNRs as I uh, as high as probably like a few hundreds of SNR, which is likely that we will be achieving in, in uh, the coming 10 years, then you see that at, at those high SNRs, it's actually important to use the very improved waveforms that we have currently or to add more improvements to uh, our current waveforms. Thank you, good to know. Thank you, Sumi. Thank you very much for adding that. To um, and then I think there's one final question, if I'm correct, from um, Yerom. Yer Yerom. Sorry, my French is not great. Um, to the nicer team, so should we expect a reduction of the radius uncertainties in the near future? Anyone? Um, yeah, in the, I guess, depends on how you define near, but we're, for, so for the targets we've already published, uh, we're still collecting data, right? So we're kind of improving the signal to no, noise, um, you know, over time. Uh, and at the same time, we're also, you know, exploring, you know, improvements in the techniques and incorporating information from other observatories about to kind of, you know, uh, especially kind of because, you know, as you mentioned, NICER is a non-imaging instrument. So we collect a lot of flux from everything that's in that field of view, right? So using independent information from other telescopes like XMM to kind of get a better handle of what's the flux coming from the pulsar itself and what's coming from everything else. And at the same time, we have, we're improving the calibration of the telescope, which will help us kind of uh, pin down those kind of systematics that arise from the fact that we don't know, we, you know, the instrument is not perfect, right? So we, and we're improving our understanding of it. And then the additional fact is uh, constraining the kind of the ambient background that NICER collects. So all the like the non-photon background that uh, kind of, sneaks into the telescope and also optical light uh, that also gets in there. So having improved models for all of those things or at least additional information to fold into the analysis, uh, plus the improved signal to noise, we should kind of expect to, uh, to, to get better constraints in the radius. And we have additional targets that we're currently analyzing, right? So, so it's all, you know, it's coming along, so. Uh, so yeah, it's definitely going to be an improvement. Thank you, Slavko. Um, Anna, Cole, Pat, anyone would like to add to that? Okay, so I'm just looking at the time because I think we've been sitting down for two and a half hours on Zoom, which I personally am not such a fan of um, such long sessions. So I really want to thank you all um, for sitting through this marathon session, but really um, want to say a big, big thank you to all the speakers for making it and giving such excellent talks and doing this obviously in a virtual format, which is non-optimum and to everyone else for participating and for um, asking lots of great questions. As many of you have mentioned, we should be in Trento eating great food now and I wish we were so keep that sort of in your imagination that I wish and we wish as organizers we were all there but really a big thank you and see you tomorrow at 3 p.m and looking forward to the Thursday discussion to carry on some of what was brought up this afternoon thank you and thank you to all the speakers from all the organizers bye